When you're ready, Lucy. All right, great. Welcome everybody. It's 609 and this is community board one's full board meeting. Uh, we start with a public session and go into the business meeting during the public session. We will allow people from the public to speak. However, please note it will be two minutes. There is a timer at the end of two minutes. You will be muted if you have already spoken at a public meeting. It is recorded for record. I ask you to think carefully if you may necessarily need to speak again, because we have a very long board meeting ahead of us. We've had long committee meetings and we've tried to accommodate as many people as humanly possible on each of those. So with that in mind, we're going to open the public session. Lucy, you coming back? Okay, great. All right. So let's get started. And I believe from our elected uh, fantastic representatives, I'm welcoming Assemblymember Deborah Glick, who's with us. Deborah? Are we, are we giving her a timer? You can. <laughs> so, Deborah, can you do it in, in four minutes, double what we're giving the public? Because I may end up having to cut the public down to one if we run out of time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be really quick. Um, can you hear me? Great. We can. Um, Thank you. I, I know that uh, elected officials who get a microphone uh, are sometimes just unaware that time is passing, but I appreciate the length of time. And so, one, I want to wish everybody a happy and healthy holiday season, and hopefully in the new year we will see even more uh, support for the city and state, which we desperately need. Um, and, of course, we will be working to um address the budget shortfall on our own with uh, a variety of revenue that we hope we can get uh, the governor to agree to i have a lot of uh, bills we sent a report i think it probably has some of those or i will tell you all about them in the new year um but the one thing i want to raise is my deep concern about the governor's island um that proposal is um, totally um, insufficient and in terms of its public input. It seems the city has determined that while everybody is worried about their health, their ability to um, buy food uh, and um, assist uh, the local businesses in staying alive, it is a good time to do up zonings and to rezone Governor's Island. Uh, they're trying to um, green, paint it green or greenwash it by having some sort of alleged climate center. Uh, but what they're doing is eliminating open space. Uh, we'll wind up with, you know, hotel, retail, or whatever uh, commercial activity, and uh, we will be losing desperately needed open space. Uh, so, while it's not in my district, I uh, feel it impacts people in my district and people in lower Manhattan, and therefore I'm weighing in. Um, what NYU did in their proposals years ago was to count the walkways uh, as open space, and that's what the city is doing here, too. Roadways, walkways are part of the open space consideration. So uh, with that, I will simply say that um, I very much appreciate the time uh, and I hope you have a very successful uh, meeting and that everybody stay safe. Uh, we're all looking forward to a vaccine and be well uh, and have as good a holiday as you possibly can. Thank you. I hope I did that shorter than anybody else will. I just want to say thank you, Deborah. Susan Cole, thank you for stepping up. It's most appreciated. We thank we thank you. We are very grateful to have you as our elected representative in Community District 1. And thank you for always coming to our CB meetings. We truly, truly appreciate the support. Stay on. It's going to be a robust dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. All righty. Um, we're going to go into the public portion. I'm going to call your name. You will be unmuted. I'm going to try and keep up for um, listen for your name so you know when you will be unmuted, please. 
All right, we um, I'm going to go Elaine Kennedy. Jonathan Bulware, Susan Peters. Okay, not every here, let me just double check. Susan, actually, I'm going to have you wait to talk because we're going to cover um, South Street Seaport Museum 250 Water Street first. So I'm going to try and get to those people who have signed in for that first. All righty. So we'll go Elaine Kennedy. Then we're going to go to Jonathan Bulware, and then um, I'll call two others. Okay. Elaine, you have two minutes. Lucy, can you say when you have unmuted her, please? Elaine, you can be all set. Okay, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Elaine Kennedy. I am a member of the Board of Directors of Southbridge Towers and I'm speaking for the entire board. When we say that we are against breaking the zoning envelope established in 2003 to designate the historic district from Pearl Street down. Pearl Street was the beach and everything below leading to the water is landfill, which is why it's zoned district to begin with. Um, the transitional zone that's been referenced by Howard Hughes um, is 120 zoning. Um, we, we did take into consideration that there was this transitional zone. And um, it, it, it's uh, not 70 feet or uh, it's 120 feet as opposed to 70 feet or 40 feet, whatever the lower buildings are. Allowing this breach of the zoning opens up what little remains of the historic district to further development down the road and sets a bad precedent for other low rise areas in the city, such as Soho already under consideration and Greenwich Village, which have managed to maintain their low rise character for decades. There can be no price placed on what is really a preserving history for future generations. Museum cannot be separated from the historic district nor placed in higher importance than the district itself. We are asking CB1 to resolve to support us in our fight with landmark committing city planning and ULA. Um, this is a moment in the long history of the seaport where its fate resides with us. Look at the decisions that are made here 50 or 100 years from now. Will we go down as having saved the Seaport Historic District and preserved its legacy for future generations and or the ones who destroyed it? Thank you for your consideration. And I just want to say that I agree um, with uh, Deborah Glick on the uh, zoning and changes made to Governor's Island. Thank you very Thank you. much. And then we're to Jonathan Bullworth. Diana, if you can unmute him. Go ahead, Jonathan. Members of the public. Hello. Ah, good evening. Hi. Chair Melcher, members of Community Board One, members of the public. Saving the seaport means saving the South Street Seaport Museum. My name is Jonathan Bulware. I live in the seaport with my family and I serve as the president of the museum. I'm here to advocate tonight for the museum and the district that is its counterpart. I agree with Elaine that one cannot live without the other. In its five decades, the museum has been a leader in education, interpretation, in environmental education, professional mariner training, maritime history, both domestically and internationally. The museum connects New Yorkers to our cultural and economic history, the bold and the shameful, shameful stories of how New York was made, stories of the people who built a global metropolis from a seaside trading port. Yet, despite myriad programmatic achievements for which the museum is known worldwide, it has struggled perennially, entirely because of a lack of reliable revenues, those that were originally intended to come from the real estate in the district. We've been kept alive by the hard work and devotion of staff, board, and volunteers, but if the Seaport Museum is to successfully emerge from this crisis, we must act. You have heard and you will continue to hear the museum's many advocates speaking passionately and ardently for the future of the museum. Indeed, we have launched a campaign to do exactly that whenever and wherever there's an ear. In my view, the proposed developments in the Seaport will create a stronger South Street Seaport Historic District one that has, as intended, a strong Seaport Museum as its beating heart. It's hard to find a clearer definition of appropriateness. It will support, too, a stronger New York City 
and it will create long-term stability for the museum, without which both the district and the city will be poorer. I urge you and I ask of you that you consider the proposed solution before you and any and all viable solutions for the future. Saving our seaport means saving the seaport museum. One cannot live without the other. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you do with the museum. All right, we're gonna go to Stacy Shubb, and then we're gonna go, pardon me as I get the names ready, to Paul Hovitz. Stacy. Anna, can you unmute? Stacy is unmuted. Can you hear me? No. Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, Stacy, we hear you loud and clear. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Stacy? Diana, stop the timer. We'll have to reset it. Uh, let's mute Stacy. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Stacy, can you hear Sorry. us? Sorry. Yeah, no, I wasn't able to hear you. Thank you so much okay. for your patience. Diana, um, oh, wait, Diana, start the timer and Stacy, please go. Thank you. Um, members of Community Board 1, Landmarks Preservation Committee. First, I want to make sure to mention that uh, Seaport Coalition strongly is in opposition to the rezoning of Governor's Island for the reasons that were mentioned. I need to stress that fundraising for the museum, although an important concern that we share, is not relevant for this landmarks discussion, nor is the parking lot itself, which obviously nobody likes. It is the mass, bulk, height, and appropriateness of the building on the lot within the historic district that we are discussing. To date, we have over 6,161 people, that's 6,161 people who have signed the petition, the petition opposing Howard Hughes Corporation's plan for 250 Water Street as causing irreparable harm to the low scale nature of the South Street Seaport Historic District. Signers are mostly local community members, but they also come from other parts of the world, from visitors, preservationists, nautical enthusiasts, and past New Yorkers who treasure the jewel that is the historic sea seaport. We are just the stewards of this district and it is incumbent upon us to protect it for future generations. The comments have already been submitted along with the signatures to CB1. We respectfully ask that they be entered into the record. I will read a few of them here. Uh, the Seaport District is one of the few places in Lower Manhattan that is not hemmed in by tall structures on all sides. It's imperative that we keep the district low in height to preserve the character of this collection of late 18th and 19th century buildings. This tower will dominate and be visible from every square inch of the historic district. We cannot let this happen. This project is literally in the flood zone. Enough is enough with the destruction of anything resembling a living city. The special zoning for the South Street Seaport area was passed by unanimous vote by City Council, our current City Council member, Margaret Chin, Borough President Gail Brewer, uh, and they can help protect this historic area just by opposing this EULA process. Thank you. Stacy. thank you very much. Diana, can you unmute Paul Hovitz? Go ahead, Paul. Paul. Paul Hovitz. We'll come back to him, Lucian, if you can uh, reach him in the chat. Let's move on to Samir Lavingia. And I am so, I apologize. I know I didn't get that right. Samir. Uh, how do you, what's the first few letters? S-A-M-I-R. Did you find Samir? I know it's packed. Um, I cannot find Samir. Okay, maybe Samir has not. We'll come back. Okay. Um, Bobby Barnett. B O B B I. Hi, yeah. Bob. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for. Uh, listening to this testimony. My name is Bob and I work a few blocks from 250 Water Street. I wanted to voice my support for the proposed project and I'll try and keep it as brief as I possibly can. Like speakers who have shared testimony before this community board on previous evenings, I find nothing of historic value related to the surface parking located at this site currently. 
In fact, on my frequent walks around the neighborhood during the workday, I find that the parking lot is an eyesore that takes me away from the beauty of BC Ford's past. Adding a building, particularly one with a facade designed to blend in with the aesthetic of the historic district would be an appropriate change that would improve the historic value of the site to the area. The fact that this project would add badly needed housing and a vital lifeline for the historic Seaport Museum may not be a major consideration for the Landmarks Committee, but this should absolutely be a larger consideration when considering this project. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening and have a good one. Thank you very much. We're going to move from there to Adrian and Andy Sosin. Yeah. Hello? Hi, we can hear you, but you need to turn your speakers down, please. Yes. Okay. Do you hear me now? We do. Go ahead and Lucy, start the timer. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about the fact that I have to oppose the Howard Hughes plans for 250 Water Street as totally inappropriate and a behemoth taking up a full block high apartment towers rising above it. It is ahistoric and the towers looming over the low rise blocks will ruin the seaport's historic ambiance by being Google from everywhere. Uh, it's my and my neighbors and my family's position that flood mitigation is a primary existential need for the seaport. This proposal from Howard Hughes will doom the historic South Street Seaport, not keep it alive. And the museum will die with it. So if, if we have to put landfill into the East River as flood mitigation, it will kill everything around it as far as the seaport's ambiance. So using the 250 Water Street lot for other purposes and resiliency are what I would recommend. Obviously, um, the Howard Hughes Corporation has dangled an endowment and um, building plan for the museum. And the museum is very important to me, and I was an early member. I now ask you to reject that premise that Howard Hughes can link approval of 250 Water Street's towers including the purchase and inappropriate transfer of city-owned air rights. We have a zoning limit and precedent that must be defended. And I called on Community Board 1 to do that. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and speaking. We uh, really appreciate this. Uh, we're going to move to... I'm trying to go as you can probably tell going back and forth. Um, so we hear from both sides. Elise, E L I S E, Quise Barth. Yes, I'm here. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elise Quise Barth. I'm part of the Howard Hughes Corporation Seaport Museum team. The 20th century history of preservation in the seaport defines a series of unique relationships that make this development not precedent setting within this or any other historic district. The benefits that accrue to the Seaport Museum discussed by others are tied to the proposal at 250 Water Street. The characteristics of the 250 site are also unique. This full block parking lot is larger than empty lots in any other historic district, and it is sited on the district's edge. Buildings in this part of the district display a wider diversity of height, bulk, date than the central core. And unlike many districts, the seaport has had a backdrop of skyscrapers since the beginning of the 20th century. Regarding appropriateness, a tall building at 250 is part of the continuum of construction of tall buildings linked to seaport preservation through the transfer of development rights. 199 Water Street, for example, is technically and undeniably outside the district. However, it does in fact sit on the district edge at Front and Fulton Streets. Like the 250 water proposal, its position on a narrow street does not hinder the appreciation of the historic buildings across the way. Consider that. But 
also considered uh, a considered improvement. The proposed 250 water towers are set back at key points to relieve the view sheds. They are of lighter material and appropriately designed to differentiate them from the street wall and from the district. Finally, the seaport is populated with buildings illustrating subtle variety of proportion, height, fenestration pattern, material, and color. These devices are appropriately employed in the base of the proposed building. Completing the street walls creates an intimate street experience typical of the district. And it thank you very thank you very much. Next, we're going to go to. I apologize. Uh, we're going to recognize Christopher Marte. And just so we can move along after that, after Christopher Marte is going to be Kamu Ware. And I apologize if I butchered your name. Hi, can you hear me? We can, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I strongly support the Landmarks Committee resolution to protect the Seaport Historic District. The resolution of 128 a precedent that all historic districts are for sale. Per Community Board once previous supported resolution, the, created of, the creation of a new receiving site for the Seaport's development rights is an ideal method to meet the demands of parents to keep the neighborhood safe for their children and preservationists to help the Seaport to remain truly historic. It will still allow the developer to sell, sell their air rights to financially support the Seaport Museum, local small businesses, and the services that make this district livable and community-centric. This provides a clear answer to what has become a divisive issue that has put community interest against community interest. I hope members of Community Board 1 vote yes on this landmarks resolution to save the history and the future of the Seaport. In addition, I'd like to thank the Community Board for working tirelessly, tirelessly on this issue for over a year and for the Seaport Coalition for all the work they have done and the activism they have brought to this issue. Thank you. Timmy, are you muted? Yeah, Timmy, we can't hear you. Tammy, we can't hear you. Diana, did you find Kamu? K A M A U. K A M A U. Got him. From Black from Black okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Mr. Ware? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, you're unmuted, please go. You, you can't hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay, yes, we can. Sorry. I, I, I couldn't tell I was on, I apologize. Um, my name is Kamal Ware, I'm the founder of the Black Gotham Experience, which is an artist-led storytelling project that illustrates the impact of the African diaspora through aesthetics and scholarship, we started out in 2010 with a series of walking tours that helped people understand the consequences of erasing black history in places like New York City. We've been a part of the Seaport District since 2017, when our project was awarded a residency with Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, which was possible because of the Howard Hughes Corporation. In addition to supporting our residency, Howard Hughes Corporation has also supported a mural project we've done around Pride in 2019, and also supporting our epicenter tour at City Hall. We feel sincere that we have a partnership working with Howard Hughes to make the Seaport District more dynamic, inclusive, and authentic. And we also enjoy a good working relationship with the Seaport Museum. And we also continue to work with City Hall, LMCC, and others, and also people who are part of our organization live and also work in the Seaport District. So we're all about continuing the work of making this area more elevated in its consciousness. And we think that we can do that working with Howard Hughes. So we support their project. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to go to Paul Goldstein and then Paul Hovitz. Mr. Goldstein, you can unmute yourself. Um, actually, I didn't sign up to speak. 
Well done, May. I'll very quickly say a couple of words. Um, the proposal is just out of line. The Star District. This was a district created in 1987. We have four and five story buildings. To refute a couple of points that some of the speakers in favor of the project keep repeating. Talk about uh, if there is a vacant lot. There's no question about why is there a vacant lot? I'll tell you. The previous owner of the did get for an 11 story building site after Trinity and after he got approval for the 11th to build high rise buildings in so the only reason there remains is because Robert didn't want to build what was appropriate and with the historic district. Um, there are other ways to help the Seaport Museum. I think we should think about that. Certainly not the only way, and this is the absolute worst way. And finally, I'll just report and hear more. You are the group, and I will part uh, done along with all of the planning. You see, change the zone to of one hundred twenty feet in two thousand and three. Everyone should respect. That is the law. Let's live within the law and not ruin another historic district. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mr. Ho Paul Hovitz. Emmy. Paul Hovitz. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, hi, Paul. We can hear you this time. Okay, uh, you're on. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I had a little problem with my microphone before. Um, first of all, thank you for letting me speak. I wanted to wish all of you a very happy holiday. I also want to thank the community board members for the time they take from their families to help support our community. I fully understand and respect it. Um, last night, uh, we went over a number of the points, uh, uh, so I don't want to reiterate too much except to say that uh, Southbridge Towers removed 1,650 affordable housing units right across the street. With all due respect to blocking people's views, I think the affordable housing component of this proposal is key. I would also like to say that if Howard Hughes just proceeds with the as of right, we will have a 12 story, and then I understand another two to four stories because it's in the flood zone blockhouse on that property as of right the the proposal to save the museum and i'd like to remind uh, my friends on the community board who have been with me for many years that the save our seaport started a save our seaport museum this is what's important and and I I think it is it is key. The the idea of being able to apply historic air rights outside of the unit has been something that we've tried for two years. The city has consistently refused it. So the people that are saying, well, we have other choices, that is dead wrong. That is an empty promise. We need to go forward. And I asked the community board to save the museum and the seaport. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, very much for coming. Joel Sosinski is next. And after Joel Sosinski will be Spencer, Spencer you spoke last night. Uh, James Captain. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm looking for new people. William Von Potkamer will be after that. Diana? I don't see a Joel in attendees. Uh, S-O-S-I-N-S-K-Y? Uh, nope. Okay. 
Warren Green. Hello. Warren, go ahead. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I think that we need to remember that this is a, an historic district. Anything that goes into that space should reflect what went on way back when in the 1700s and the 1800s. Oh, two 47-story towers makes absolutely no sense. And in addition, the entire community will then have to somehow support the additional number of people that 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 um, that that structure will 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 have. Additionally, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train. I also have to say that we need as much green space as possible. And therefore, I believe that the rezoning of of Governor's Island is improper. Um, and that's all I have to say at this point. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to William Von Potkemmer, and I definitely know that I butchered that, so I'm going to say I'm sorry. And then after no. that's going to be Joel Sosinski. Okay, thank you. Can everyone, can you hear me? We can indeed. Welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, hi, my name is William. I'm here representing the Mississippi Seaport Hotel at 33 Pike Slip. And um, we want to say on behalf of all of the hotel and of course of all of the entire Chupiani family, uh, we support the Howard Hughes project 100%. We, we do believe that the overall social and economical benefits the Seaport community is going to receive from this development is very, very big and staggering. And we are excited that an honorable corporation like Howard Hughes is deciding to expand their investment process in, in this area. Um, of course, especially under the Solskjaer's leadership, we really think that um, that this project is going to be an utter success, and uh, we are all looking forward to it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sosinski is next. After Mr. Sosinski, we're going to go to David Sheldon. Uh, Kim Boosie. Tammy, I still don't see Joel Sosinski, but I, I just moved David over to panelists, so he should be able to unmute himself. Okay. David Sheldon, you should be able to unmute yourself. David, I'm going to unmute you. Got it, got it. Go ahead, David. Okay, you can hear me? Hi, David. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Sheldon. I've been a volunteer, a member, a sailor, and contributor to the South Street Seaport Museum for 20 years now. I was also a founding member of Save Our Seaport. I have remained an active member of that organization, as well as, this, as, well as the Seaport Coalition. We advocated at our inception and continue to advocate for an active waterfront with room for museum ships. We advocate for the museum. We have never ceased doing that. It is indeed the beating heart of the district. We have advocated for a public market. We continue to do that, a market that we all remember and would love to see return. And we have, since our inception, advocated for the integrity of the Seaport Historic District, which is what brings me here tonight. This is not a choice between a parking lot and a building. It is a matter of what building will go in the place of that parking lot. And what is proposed to us this evening is wholly inappropriate. It will dominate and overshadow everything around it, and in fact, will block the view from Water Street. It is a immense wall. Uh, our organization, Save Our Seaport, continues, as we always have, to seek, identify, and assist to secure funding for the museum. It is not a choice between a parking lot and funding for the museum. There are other sources available. So to get to the point of this meeting, there is nothing about that building that is appropriate. It is oversized horizontally and vertically. Uh, it does not belong within the confines of this district. It is an incursion into this historic district and will mark the way for further incursions in this district and others. We urge uh this body to accept the resolution in opposition to the proposal thank you 
Thank you very much. Kim Busey is next. And after Kim Busey will be Linda Roche. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Kim Busey and I'm the founder of the Quad Preparatory School and a community board resident for almost two decades. Um, I was the inaugural um, PTA president of the Spruce Street School and I was very lucky to have had a community that allowed for such a quality education in our community. I have since devoted my life to remaining in the community, um, buying a home here, starting businesses here, and, and creating nonprofit schools. Um, I am an educator and a clinician, and I have deep ties to this community. And to me, um, there, it, it, there is no question in my mind that this is the right plan for 250 Water Street. It is the best possible solution at this point in time for families, businesses, and workers in our neighborhood. We're in the middle of a world wide pandemic. We have, we have already survived two enormous um, blows to our community, and this offers relief right now. Um, with a company that has been highly responsible neighborhood, Howard Hughes, um, they've worked with local nonprofits tirelessly, and they have really embraced the Seaport Museum, which is an essential institution that everyone's talking about, and they're embracing it now, not some future time that is in the in the future. Um, I think it's going to make it. I, I actually think it's going to save our community because in the current financial situation that we're going to find ourselves in very soon. Um, and it's going to make it even better and work for our current residents, but also lure new residents here. It'll make a home for them. The design of this building, in my opinion, will not only honor the need of the historic district, it also needs the, it meets the needs of everyone living, working, and educating their children here today. Okay, thank you very much. Linda Roche, you are next. But before you go, I'm um, going to put a shout out to uh, the board from the South Street Seaport Museum, who it seems has entirely signed on to speak. I know Jonathan has spoken. I know Saul has signed up to speak as well. And I would ask, um, do you want to have one person have a couple more minutes, or do you want every single board member to opine. You can chat back to the host on what you guys decide, and that would be great. Um, and so Linda Roche, after Linda, we're gonna go to David Karnovsky. Yeah. Linda, are you on? I am. You, you can hear me, I assume. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've resided across the street from the parking lot since 1978. The application to construct twin 470 foot towers within the historic district, when the zoning height that was approved by our elected officials, EDC landmarks in 2003, is 120 feet, was a compromise since all the buildings within the historic district are between four and six stories. So the community has fought against many out of scale developments by the Milstein family, and they were turned down by landmarks because they were not in compliance. I believe it was the last application by the Milstein family to construct a new building where the commission found that, and I quote, the proposed scale, size, mass, and volume of the 30 story tower would dominate and overwhelm the neighboring buildings in this low scale district and that the size of the 30 story tower would cause an abrupt change in scale within the district, disrupting the district's harmonious low scale quality, that the design proposed uh, located at the western boundary of the district would uh, relate more closely to the scale and uh, massing of the buildings outside the historic district rather than those within the historic district, thus virtually confusing the clear boundary of the historic district. And on that basis, the commission found that the proposed new building to, to be inappropriate um, for the historic district. Uh, this community has always said, we would like to see Howard Hughes build something on the lot that conforms to the existing zoning of 120 feet and encourage them to allow 100% affordable housing. That's not an issue. 
allowing the rezoning of this historic district would be setting a dangerous precedent for the entire city of New York. And that includes Governor's Island. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Moving on. Diana, who do we have is next? David Karnofsky, perhaps? Yes. David, are you there? I'm here, uh, David Karnofsky, Land Use Counsel to Howard Hughes for the project. Thank you, but I will not be speaking tonight. So you've just saved yourself two minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. So then we're gonna go to, sorry, I'm trying to, as you can tell, go back and forth. Uh, um, the next person would be, we'll do Tom Burton. And then after Tom Burton, we're going to do. Goodness gracious, I apologize. We have more people who have just signed down. Um, after Tom Burton, we're going to go to Lynn Ellsworth. Tom, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I, I have, I don't see Tom in panelist. I do see a Tom in attendees, but uh, it's first name only. So that's Tom. probably that's him. Hi, is this Tom Burton? Yeah. Okay, maybe we could circle back. Okay. There's no response from Tom. We'll circle back. Do, do Lynn Ellsworth. Hi, Lynn. Lynn, are Lynn. you there? Lynn. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, this is going faster than I thought. Uh, William Thomas. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Will Thomas. Uh, I'm here to support the proposal for uh, 250 Water Street uh, as a representative of Oak Work. Uh, we're an independent, all-volunteer, uh, pro-housing organization. I, I just want the community board to consider, to some extent, the human impact of down, uh, downsizing this project. A uh, hundred affordable homes are nothing to sniff at, and even judging on purely aesthetic grounds, income and racial diversity in a neighborhood surely impacts its built character in many ways. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about context how this project will fit into the neighborhood. Uh, for what it's worth, I feel like it complements its neighbors in an architectural sense, uh, especially the brick podium base. And for lower Manhattan, the height doesn't strike me as particularly offensive. I'm sure many will disagree with me there, uh, but people disagree vehemently when it comes to architecture. Uh, but where I hope uh, the community board will wholly agree with me is that the proposal is a guaranteed improvement on what currently exists, unless you feel passionately that the Robert Moses ideal of ample parking is the history of the district ought to be preserving here. Um, I also think it's important to note that the project as proposed would give the Seaport Museum funding, um, which will help to convey the history of the neighborhood itself in a very literal sense. Uh, and then also we have to remember the historic district itself exists only in large part because of the efforts of the Seaport Museum. So I would find it deeply ironic if the community board were to determine that the project couldn't go forward because it didn't mesh well enough with the neighborhood's history. Uh, finally, I think that the, a more substantial residential building will help to better knit the neighborhood together in terms of uses to help it feel more cohesive as a place to live rather than a tourist destination. Uh, the more residents, the more the neighborhood, the more the neighborhood as a whole will cater to residents, a furthering a historic and not to mention better use of the neighborhood. So in terms of architecture, history, I feel this project really fits. Um, so please think flexibly on the purpose of a historic district. Thank you so much. We're going to go to Joanne Gorman next. Lucian, can you get Joanne Gorman? Yep, got her. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Joanne. Joanne. 
Hello? Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I want to, um, with Friends of South Street Seaport, I want to speak for a minute on the fantasy building being proposed for the museum at the John Street lot across from Imagination Park. The proposed John Street building is meant to be an amazing new face of the South Street Seaport Museum. And yet we are shown a fairly ordinary building that would occupy a prime corner within a spectacular block of historic buildings. The Skirmahorn Row Houses, the AA Low Building among them. Adding shutters to the windows is a superficial use of an historic element to otherwise dress up a plain facade. And the arches at the building's ground floor are out of sync with the look and feel of the upper portion of the building. In fact, they come across as an attempt to modernize the first floor of an older building. But more important than any details regarding this proposal, we are faced with having to waste time on something that should be pulled from the application, a concept that can only be viewed as a space filler to pad out a funding promise being used to gain support for an ill-conceived tower development. Please reject this portion of the application as irrelevant to what can realistically be reviewed and reject in its entirety the 250 Water Street application. And just as an aside, I just want to address a comment that somebody made about equating 250 Water and 199 Water Street as being on the edge of the district. 199 is clearly outside the district. 250 Water is clearly within. There's no equation here that's worthwhile. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to move ahead. Thomas S. Apologize. William S. Thomas. Hi, I already spoke. William Thomas, please. I, you already, I already spoke. spoke. Thank you. Yeah. I apologize. Thank you so much. So we're going to go to Chris Cooper. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, my name's, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. My name is yeah. Chris Cooper. Great, and I'm from SOM. I'm part of the design team for the 250 proposal. So we certainly agree and recognize the South Street Seaport Historic District is unique in scale and in character. And it's known for its pedestrian friendly cobblestone streets defined by low cornice lines, active street fronts, and heavily textured, mostly masonry street facades. This proposal is a unique opportunity to enhance and to expand that rich streetscape by filling a hole in the district's current urban fabric. The 250 Water Street site is located on the edge of this great district. At the transition point between the tall skyline of lower Manhattan and the lower scale of the seaport. Our proposal is to complete the district and reinforce a clear boundary with a properly scaled podium that revitalizes the district's streetscape. The podium is designed to complement the scale, character, material, and color of the historic district and embraces a well-established planning concept of a low contextual street wall with towers set back and distinguished from their base. And together, the podium with setback towers recognizes and maintains the historic experience of the Seaport District as one of low scale street walls with towers as its backdrop. This has been the condition historically and is very much the context today. We believe that good design with focus on scale, proportion, material, and detail can enhance the experience and the pleasure of this great historic neighborhood. Thank you. Mike, next we're gonna to go to Michael Kramer. Okay, thank Mr. you, Michael Tammy. Kramer, uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Michael. The Seaport Coalition is an all volunteer organization consisting of Save Our Seaport, Southbridge Towers, Children First and others. We want to state for the record that we support 
the two community board resolutions that were hammer out, hammered out over five hours last night. And we, we decry uh, the tying the approval for an inappropriate tower with, I think what Joanne was trying to say was an imaginary building next to imaginary, imagination playground. Uh, the Seaport Historic District was designated in 77 and later extended in 89. Because it's a special historic 11 block low rise area, no one is, is uh, disputing that. It's clearly distinct and apart from the modern skyscrapers surrounding it. So no matter what Chris has just said, we reject the implication that the present parking lot is anything but an integral part of the historic district. The city administrative code empowers LPC to delineate a historic district boundary that embodies a distinct section of the city. Vacant lots, parking lots, and no style insignificant buildings are a typical feature of any urban landscape and are thus likely to be and have been included in historic district boundaries. As Paul Goldstein pointed out, the only reason it's, it's empty is because when the Milstein family tried nine times to, to come up with a proposal, the only proposal that was uh, accepted, they chose not to build. A most instructive example for us is historic Front Street, as developed in 05 by the Durst Organization. 24 Peck Slip, 254 Front Street. They're all perfect examples of what new construction could look like that replaced a series of ruins, parking, and vacant lots between front and water and streets with new modern elements that meld into their older surroundings rather than undermine them. Happy holidays to everybody at Community Board One, and thanks for, for listening. Okay. And then second. And then. I, it says I can't. Ahead, Brendan. Is, You're is there. We hear you. Hi. Hello, how are you? Good evening. Thanks for letting us speak. I'm here I, <clears throat> for the South Street Seaport Museum <clears throat> with a frog in my throat to give a sort of marine ambiance. I'm the chair of the board of the South Street Seaport Museum, and I'm in support of this proposal with a uh, very strong emphasis on the word support. It's a proposal for, um, of course, market rate housing, affordable housing, some community space, some rental, but it, it has a community benefits package as part of this proposal. It is all part of this proposal and the community benefits package as everybody on this phone call must already know, or at this meeting, I should say. The community benefits would adhere, I mean, some of it's affordable housing, et cetera, but they would adhere, adhere largely to our museum, the South Street Seaport Museum. Nobody else is ours. Lower Manhattan, South Street Seaport Museum, which is on the brink of disaster. We were not a very wealthy institution ever, but after 2008 and Sandy and now COVID, we are on the brink of disaster. We're already largely closed. We're keeping open only because of our wonderful, gorgeous volunteers. And, uh, and of course, people like Jonathan Boer who's spoken tonight. And this proposal, this entire, look at it entirely. Yes, it's for uh, some new buildings, it's for some affordable housing, and it includes a community benefits package that would save our museum. How can we possibly decide on this only on the basis of how high a building is? This is a major, major opportunity for a neighborhood, an investment of a, nearly a billion dollars and a saving of the South Street Seaport Museum. And yes, I am in favor, very strongly so. Thank you. Okay. Tammy, you're muted. Tammy, Lucian. Tammy, I'm sorry, you were muted until you said my name. What, what um, who's, who would you like to call next? We're gonna go through all the board members together because I think that's just going to be that much easier. So let's do Catherine McVeigh Hughes and then Ernest Tullerson. Catherine, you're unmuted. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Good evening. Um, thank you, community board members. Um, 
My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. As most of you probably know, I served on community board one for 20 years. Half of that time as chair or vice chair. And I have lived downtown since 1988. In all that time, we never saw any motion on the 250 Water Street site. So it's great to see that change at last. As someone who cares about our neighborhood and is committed to its future, these are seven points I would like to make about this proposal. One, it replaces an eyesore with a beautiful building designed by a world-renowned architect. Two, it eliminates a contaminated brownfield that has threatened the neighborhood for more than a century. Three, it restores affordable housing lost when South Bridge Towers went private. Four, it brings new residential customers to the restaurants and small businesses of the neighborhood. Five, it provides new facilities for schools such as the Play Street and Community Center. Six, it creates a new future for the South Street Seaport Museum, its vessels and collections, its education mission, including maritime history and print shop. Seven, it demonstrates a billion dollar commitment to lower Manhattan post COVID and post Sandy, a transformative investment that reminds me of how the neighborhood turned around the corner after 9-11. Questions, will it be contextual? It's more contextual than a parking lot. Will it increase congestion? It replaces a car and truck traffic with foot traffic. Will it mean, what will it mean for local services? It provides amenities that we have fought for for decades at a time of significant budgetary constraints. Thank you. As I'm a proud board member of the South Street Seaport Museum, I hope that you will support the proposal because it plans to save the South Street Seaport Museum, which is the heart of our historic district. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Let's continue with the board members and go to Ernest Tollerson. Uh, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nelson. Yes. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ernest Tollerson. I'm on the board of the South Street Seaport Museum, um, and I've lived in Lower Manhattan for nearly 40 years. Uh, my wife and I have raised two kids uh, in the neighborhood. Um, I think everyone on this board is certainly familiar with the both the land side and pure side assets uh, of the South Street Seaport Museum. Um, uh, maybe I'm biased, but I, I think they help the historic district uh, to come alive. Um, as a trustee of the uh, museum, uh, I'm eager to rebuild the museum's sources of recurring operating revenue. So I have a deep and abiding interest in the community benefits fund that would be created if 250 Water Street site, if the 250 Water Street site is uh, developed. So should a viable appropriate development proposal emerge from the yearly process, the South Street Seaport Museum and affordable housing should be the primary beneficiaries of the pool of funds earmarked for community benefits. As a long-term resident of Lower Manhattan, um, I also believe that the community benefits fund should finance the creation of more space for active recreation, think uh, of the configuration of active space at Battery Park City, and the implementation of a Barcelona-inspired approach to shared streets, reimagine public space, better ways of handling garbage, and other elements of our new Amsterdam uh, streetscape. Uh, so, you know, rethinking and rationalizing the use of public space south of Chambers and east of Broadway is essential uh, if we want this uh, neighborhood to work and if we want to make the South Street Seaport Museum's existing campus and ships visible and, and legible. Um, you know, a good step in that direction obviously would be embracing the ideas outlined and make way for lower uh, Manhattan. So in short, um, you know, the viability of our world south of Chambers and east of Broadway could be enhanced and transformed by using the Community Benefits Fund to prioritize two smart investments, making the South, South Street Seaport Museum a stronger cultural institution, an institution that was designed to be an anchor, designed to benefit from any development that goes on within the district and building affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll continue with board members, Christina Huss and David Sheehan. We'll be the next two board members who speak. And the, uh, I should elaborate. This would be board members of the South Street Seaport Museum. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'll be brief and I really appreciate you allowing the board from the South Street Seaport Museum to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Christy Hoos. I'm the vice chair of the board of trustees. I'm also a resident of lower Manhattan for over 15 years. And I want to lend my support to this proposal for 250 water, which I believe is appropriate because it provides a unique opportunity to save the South Street Seaport Museum with the funds it needs to survive. In addition to raising my two young children, I also work in lower Manhattan and I know how contentious land use decisions in our neighborhood can be, but I also know the positive impact investment can have and the incredible value that cultural institutions bring to our community. As our city recovers economically from COVID, we won't be the same city if we were beforehand, if we lose the cultural anchors. And as Brendan said, the Seaport Museum is on the verge um, of going under. So preserving our cultural institutions is preserving the spirit of our neighborhood and what makes us unique and why people move here and why people visit and why people decide to put roots down in lower Manhattan. It's good for all of us and it's the core of how I'm thinking about appropriateness of the development here. The South Street Seymour Museum gives this neighborhood its character. It helped keep history alive with the stories it tells with the people who built the city. I know that in theory, everyone supports the Seaport Museum um, to keep it alive well into the future, but this proposal is how we do it. This, with this plan, we have real financial benefits for the museum in the next 18 month window that we have to secure its future. So I hope you support the future for the South Street Seaport Museum and the cultural identity of our neighborhood. And I thank you again for the opportunity this evening. Thank you very much. David Sheehan goes next. Thank you. David, Great. You go. Thank you. Hello, good evening. And I want to thank um, CB1 for letting myself and our colleagues uh, speak tonight. Uh, my name is David Sheehan, and I'm the board treasurer of the South Street Seaport Museum. I also serve as the executive vice president and chief financial officer at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. I've spent my career making the finance, uh, managing the finances of nonprofit and government agencies. And my goal here tonight is to underscore for you just how urgent the need for the South Street Seaport Me Museum really is. I don't want to mince words here. We cannot put off saving the museum for some point far in the future. We have about an 18 month window to right the ship. It's that simple. So as we have a discussion on appropriateness, we really have to remember that the core part of determining appropriateness is how the project will impact a neighborhood. And this project, despite what others might say, will actually help preserve the historic qualities that make our neighborhood special. Key funding for the museum is sunsetting next year, and that could be the ball game, unless we secure reliable recurring revenue to undergrid the museum's operations before that happens. The Howard Hughes plans would provide the museum with a pathway, not just to survive, but to thrive, to address key capital needs, support itself financially, and reopen from a place of strength, and then begin to invest in its future. I support this plan as the only viable opportunity available to us right now to save this community, anchor, and the spirit of our neighborhood. I hope you do as well. Thank you. And have a great night. I figure I figure it's just going to be easier to go through all the board members at once, and then I'll go through the other side. So uh, we have a couple more board members who have not spoken yet. Again, I'm going to give them time if they would like it. Craig Page, then Davin Savage, Yamazaki, all have signed up. So Craig, you're first, and then Davin. If I pronounce that correctly, you said Craig Page or Greg. And this is uh, this is Lucian. I'm hosting right now. Um, listen at the two minute mark. Uh, I'm going to hit mute because we have to keep moving through everyone. So thank you for understanding. Craig, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I am Craig Page. Um, I grew up across the East River from the South Street Seaport Museum. Um, I see it struggling at the moment and believe that economic development in the area will be the lifeblood of the neighborhood 20, 20 years from now. It will bolster an institution that 
brings education out of the classroom and into the kind of the tangible real world, which really draws people into furthering their education and continuing to contribute to the local neighborhood and uh, further their own careers. Uh, the South Street Seaport exhibits a lot of um, aspirational and um, real world um, cultural references that must be continued and doing so requires um, development that will also help ancillary institutions. Thank you very much. Vivian, you're next. Hi, great, thanks so much. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, my name is Bevan savage Yamazaki, and I'm also a board member with the South Street Sea Force. I also lead Gensler's um, not-for-profit and cultural practice. So I focus mostly on making cultural institutions successful during my daytime job. And really what I focus on most is how I keep people coming through the doors of those institutions. I got involved with the museums because of my love for arts and culture and really what it does for our city. Culture pulls people here, despite many difficulties of living in New York. People choose to move here, they choose to stay here. And much of that is to do with the cultural infrastructure. People follow culture, jobs follow people. Without it, that bill breaks, plain and simple. We cannot call our city recovered if we lose our cultural institutions. That is our local identity. That is the quality that makes our neighborhoods unique. So that's really what the crux of the issue around appropriateness is here with the survival of South Street Seaport balance. So you've heard a lot about the fate of what awaits the museum without the infusion of a reliable recurrent revenue. But I also wanna talk a little bit about what makes that you know, possible if we should stabilize the museum, what the museum could become. It houses many maps and artifacts and wonderful photos of the 18th century, cornices from buildings gone, and there's an opportunity to share that with a larger audience should we open up um, soon in the, in, the, in the near future, hopefully. So New York is always on this and it's horrible march towards the future. And saving the South Street Seaport Museum is an opportunity to not only stay connected to our history, but also to preserve a key part of our community and culture. And that's never been more important than today. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Okay. I I think that gets us through all of the South Street Seaport Museum board members who have signed on to speak, um, as well as their design team architects who signed on to speak. I'll double check through the chat. Um, I think I've gotten through all of that. Before we go to some of the others, um, returning back to Lynn Ellsworth and others who I called who are back on now. Um, and and others, we are honored to recognize our elected officials who are with us tonight. So I want to welcome uh, Gail Brewer and also welcome Assemblymember Yuli Nu. Um, Gail, we have a very robust night in Yulene. Um, would you like to speak now for four minutes or wait? It is up to you. Gail, let's start with you. Can unmute yourself though. Hi, I can speak two minutes, Madam Chair, very, very quickly. Um, Governor's Island, we're going to do in the beginning of January, we're going to have a panel. We'll make sure you know just talking about the proposed tax amendment, the environmental study. I know you've been working on it. Um, a second, I just want to mention that we have been focused on this helicopter task force. Hundreds more in terms of those who are complaining. Uh, we found out after meeting with FAA, and I think you guys were on, and uh, people from the community and the Eastern Helicopter Association, et cetera, that it's people, young people, I'm sorry, leaving Manhattan, taking a bus, getting to New Jersey, getting on a helicopter, and coming back to take photographs over Manhattan. That seems to, there's no um, tourist. So that's kind of what's happening. So we're going to meet with New Jersey. We had a gentleman who's a council member from Hoboken who was fabulous. Same problem. So just so you know, our next meeting, Manhattan and New Jersey, and you will certainly know about it. Um, in terms of all the hard work that you're doing, so we have an affordable housing task force, and guess what some of the issues are? There are so many available hotels in the borough of Manhattan for sale. 
not a lot, but some. So we're working, we will work with you to see if there are any that could be purchased for permanent housing. Now, of course, we're still dealing with back and forth between the Upper West Side, issues regarding Lower Manhattan, and then other hotel issues and homeless in your district. So I'm very, very aware of that. Uh, we finally wrote the mayor about the public realm proposal. Board five has already uh, done one. I know that you're focused on it. 25 agencies participate in your streets and sidewalks, and they do need to coordinate. I just want to say all of the community board applications are due, uh, I think you know, uh, February 1st, and that's new members and returning members, and I hope you all return. We had a wonderful Manhattan neighborhood uh, discussion with one of your members, uh, amazing, to talk about what how important it is to be a community board member. And I want to thank um, uh, Matt, the woman who was from your board, Madam K. And I want to say that uh, in terms you. of funding, we are working uh, towards the capital budget. Go to our website. Thank you very much, and congratulations on all your hard work. Yay, wow. Thank you. Dang. Fast. Thank you very much. The fastest speaking Super elected. Thank you. Yulene, she set the bar really high for you. You're next. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, it's like kind of crazy. We're literally um, packing a bunch of bags for our uh, emergency room nurses. We uh, did, you know, things are going to be a little bit rougher now. Numbers are going back up. So um, as you know, our nurses have been working uh, really hard. So we wanted to make sure to give them an appreciation for uh, the holidays. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. Uh, really glad we could be here today. Um, you know, tomorrow, I think that we are actually scheduled uh, right now for us to be able to be in a majority conference. So I don't know what that's going to be like. Uh, we do need to discuss a couple of things as a body. Obviously, you know, I've been pushing to make sure that our state raises revenue, that we are able to, um, you know, make sure that we actually uh, do not have cuts to our social service programs across the board. These are really huge issues for us. Um, and that we uh, actually do something uh, about rent and, uh, uh, you know, especially, you know, folks in, um, you know, Gateway probably understand what that looks like right now. Um, and, and, you know, we need to make sure that we're talking a lot about some of the things that we're doing um, that are COVID related for small businesses. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that we haven't been um, able to do during this year. Uh, and we just heard that the federal government signed their 19, uh, sorry, their $900 billion um, relief uh, package, but there's not a lot for states and localities uh, in there. Um, there is a chunk that should come towards rent. And so hopefully we can get that into our small landlords uh, fund so that we can make sure to protect tenants um, and get some rent forgiveness going. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to touch base on locally, of course, is that with Governor's Island, I know that you guys covered Governor's Island today and also with um, you know 250 uh, and uh, the, um, the South Street Seaport. And I just wanted to remind everyone for for uh, you know, for all of these processes, I think that it's really important that we hear out our communities and like the community voices are so so important. Um, and you know, one of the biggest things that I think that uh, we forget is how much of this is actually um, you know done without a lot of community input. And I think that we have to make sure that we actually listen when we have that community input. Um, there are some great ideas that are being. Uh, created and talked about uh, along the uh, historic South Street Seaport, I think that we should take a look at them. I think that it's really important that we do that. I love the museum as anybody else uh, does, uh, and everybody knows that. I think that, you know, the South Street Seaport is also not just the museum, and so we have to make sure to remember that as well. Um, the reason why it's so great is, you know, actually my office is right here, and so I can look at it every every second of every day, but I think that it's really just about making sure that we remember that it's also a historic uh, area. It's, it's the preservation of the South Street uh, Seaport, historic uh, seaport is actually, um, you know, one of a kind. And so we need to make sure that uh, we are honoring that and, uh, do, you know, doing what we can to keep the South Street Seaport, the South Street Seaport, the historic South Street Seaport 
Um, it has historic zoning for that reason. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is also Governor's Island. Never has there ever been a moment or a time when there's been an expectation for Governor's Island to be quote unquote self-sustainable financially. Um, that's something that we need to actually uh, put out there. And I, and I, as a, as a member, am very clear about it because that's how we talk about it on the state level and um, how I was presented with uh, Governor's Island from jump uh, when I first took office. It was just, it's a special uh, thing that uh, it counts as green space for lower Manhattan and just wanted to put that out there so that folks understand that when we are discussing Governor's Island that it is, you know, it's our government that is uh, already, you know, funding a lot of these things and expected to fund a lot of these things for us to make it continue to be its goal, which is a public space for everyone. All right, just wanted to say happy holidays to everyone. Thank you so much for letting me take just a little bit of extra time and uh, wanted to say thank you to everyone who's also helping to volunteer this holiday season. Nice hat, Eulene, downtown Little League. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, that was my Thomas, you, good kind, uh, Thomas good kind hat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both oh, for our electives for joining us. We're headed straight back into the public session. It is 725. We really do want to move along quite quickly, um, but we do still have quite a number of people. So Lynn Ellsworth, followed by Linda Hellstrom. Hi, uh, Lynn here. Can you hear me okay? I'm clear. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, that's great. My name is Lynn Ellsworth. I've lived here in Tribeca for 34 years. I founded the Friends of Duane Park and Tribeca Trust and the Alliance for a Human Scale City. I'm an economist and I specialize in economic development theory. I raised my daughter here. Tribeca Trust and Human Scale NYC opposed the proposals for the seaport and for Governor's Island. With the seaport proposal, the real estate lobby manages to make a mockery of everything historic districts are supposed to do. The proposal should be soundly rejected. It is also part of a wider attack on historic districts that the administration is part of and would, in which incremental death by a thousand blows is part of the strategy. The Governor's Island proposal also makes a mockery of the actual deed with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The deed says that development should be consistent with the historic and civic character of the island. And to say that this proposal on the table is consistent in that way is just being Orwellian in one's use of the English language. Both proposals will do more harm than good and the good parts can be accomplished in other ways without the excessive development being proposed. It is also a tragedy that some New Yorkers have come to think that only real estate developers can give us endowments for museums with shaky audiences. Developers can give us schools, libraries, parks, and even that dubiously named thing called affordable housing. It's just not so. Thank you. And I want to thank all the community board for the hard, intense work you do on behalf of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Linda Hellstrom. Linda. Hello. I can hear I hear you loud and clear. Okay, um, I'm Linda Hellstrom and I'm testifying for both my husband, Jay and I, and we live at 273 Water Street in the Captain Rose House, built in 1773. This project at 250 Water Street is just a half block away from our house. And we and they are an integral part of the historic district, not on the edge, nor a transitional as Howard Hughes wants people to believe. And it's not about how the towers fit with the buildings outside the district. It's not about the parking lot. It's really not about how they fit into FIDI, but not about the goodies for the leverage that Howard Hughes brings to the table. This hearing is about how these 47 story buildings fit into the 10 block or 11 block uh, seaport historic district. And I can say that this proposal doesn't even meet the basic test of appropriateness, the scale and the size of the mostly four to six story buildings in the district. 
but I, I'm really upset at hearing the museum talking about only saving the museum. Um, meanwhile, they had $15 million of FEMA money that's unused. The city should be helping the museum and the other museums helping the museums. The board members need to start raising money for capital and operations. And this in the Seaport Coalition in just a few months has come up with several ways that we can save the museum. The museum is really not what we're supposed to be talking about. They're supposed to be stewards of the district. And the minute we set the precedent of having a developer come in with tall buildings like this, then other developers will use their rights into the district. So it's really talking about saving the entire district and that's what they should be talking about. Um, the museum will have exhibits inside the museum and the seaport outside the living seaport of the origin of New York um, will not be a district as we know it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm going to go to Courtney Worrell, Waterfront Alliance. Did you say the name one more time? Worrell, W O R R A L. Hi, Courtney, you're unmuted. Courtney, you're good to go. Hi, yes. Hi I'm here. Hi, I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the redevelopment of 250 Water Street. As, you, as everybody might know, uh, the Waterfront Alliance is the advocate for our region's waterfront for New York City and for the northern New Jersey portions of our waterfront and harbor. And we find that this redevelopment is a critical opportunity for the Seaport District and in particular for the South Street Seaport Museum. The parking lot, which I have personally benefited from and the Waterfront Alliance has benefited from since we are tenants of 217 Water Street, is no longer an appropriate element within the historic district, in our opinion. The building that will replace it will provide historic context and multiple community benefits. How we got to this point and the decades of missed opportunities to change the trajectory of, this, of the district and the South Street Seaport Museum are not the point of tonight's meeting. The options for changing the years of a lack of a viable future, the lack of planning that did not provide for a viable future for the museum in a way for the district have narrowed, especially now during the pandemic. Options such as the transfer of air rights to other parts of the city are limited by the current reality of our city's development policies and the ways in which we develop New York City. These large scale changes would need time that the district, in particular the museum, at this time of great challenge does not have. Uh, so, most important to the Waterfront Alliance is that the South Street Seaport Museum survives. It is one of the city's most iconic and important cultural institutions. It's an extremely important part of the city's past and future. It interprets the city through its entry point, the New York Harbor and the estuary. This harbor is representative of America's complex history, the entry point for Europeans, enslaved people, and the trade that made New York and our country what it is in all of its injustices, its beauty, and in many ways, its many contradictions. There is no other place in the city that is better positioned to interpret this history. The ships and the ships I apologize, but we have to keep it tidy. So uh, I apologize on that, but got to, got to keep moving. All right, I'm gonna go to Richard Dorfman. My name is Richard Dorfman. My name yeah. is Richard Dorfman. I've been part of the South Street Seaport Museum since 1997 as a volunteer, part-time and full-time staff member 
on the vessels and in the offices. I value the museum for its role in the preservation of the historic district and as a great source of education and context. I value the time I've spent working on the vessels and with the staff and the volunteers. I've seen firsthand the positive impact that the museum has had on its community, visitors, and groups. The life of the city is immeasurably enriched by the South Street Seaport Museum, and to allow it to fail would be a terrible loss for all parties. Thank you. Okay, Caroline Miller. Caroline, have you gone yet? I'm sorry, say that one time my baby is screaming right next to me. Caroline Miller. Hello? Caroline, you are the attendee. Hi. I'm Hi, here. Caroline. Can Did you, you know yet? No, yes, I didn't. I can. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll 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 be very brief. Um, I want to just um, speak to the importance of rejecting this proposal, not just for the historic district here, but for all of the historic districts in the city. I have listened to many, many people tonight who are supporters and, uh, and employees of the museum talking about how we should redefine appropriate in all kinds of different ways, be more flexible, include any kind of amenities in the community. Uh, as as an as a as a as, as evidence of appropriateness, and I just want to say that if that were to happen, we would have no more historic districts in this city within a very short period of time. Uh, any developer who wants to yoke, uh, you know, uh, 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 an appropriate uh, community benefit to uh, an egregious high rise like this one, you know, would have grounds to do this. And to the notion that the only thing that could be built in this in this space, other than you know the old, only alternative to having this uh, parking lot there, I just want to note that 117 new buildings have been approved or are in the approval pipeline in historic districts over the last 16 years in this city. Not one of them is anywhere near the height of this building, or this far out of scale with neighboring buildings. This is way out of the ballpark. Each approved building is carefully scaled to the districts they're in. And so uh, allowing this to proceed, uh, even though, you know, in, in order to benefit the museum, which a lot of us care about, um, would be extremely damaging to the whole concept of historic district in this city. So we, we have to say no. Okay, I think right now I'm going to take a break from this topic because we've heard quite a lot of it uh, we need we have other topics that we are going to discuss tonight and we've had the bulk of an hour's worth of testimony just on this plus our elected so we can come back to it but think carefully and definitely if you have not spoken and you feel the need to we do have other things that we do need to go over okay so on that on that note we're going to go through testimony for Governor Zeland, um, for people who have signed up to speak for that. And whew, um, let's try and start somewhere with, gosh almighty, I apologize for getting more sign-ins. Um, we're going to start with Miranda Massey from the Climate Museum. Miranda, you're able to speak. Miranda, your mic is open. Are you ready? Okay, moving on. We're going to go to Merritt Birnbaum from the Friends of Governor's Island. Merritt, you're unmuted. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, this is Merritt Birnbaum. I'm the executive director of the Friends of Governor's Island. We just want to quickly reiterate that the proposed rezoning is true to the values that we helped establish 25 years ago. 
our interest is and has always been in seeing the island respond to the public need. We've seen firsthand the benefit of a mixed use activity to attract and delight visitors from the 8,000 visitors in 2005 to the 800,000 visitors last year. The island is being used more and more by the public as a treasured amenity. But the current financial model for maintaining the park and paying for the transportation and infrastructure necessary to run it is nowhere near enough to adequately care for the island in the long term. The proposed rezoning will create a year round environment where more people can discover and enjoy the island, including increased ferry service and expanded opportunities for recreation, education and the arts. Um, rezoning is necessary to bring the allowable uses on the island in line with the deed and the public benefit requirements. So just a couple of very quick points. The area undergoing the rezoning is currently off limits to the public and filled with abandoned warehouses and parking lots. It is diminishing the public enjoyment of the island and it prevents direct access between the park and the water's edge. This area was already reserved for new construction as part of the master plan, which was developed with extensive public input, including ours in 2010. And while there have been many RFPs for the North Island Historic District, which I know uh, everyone is very concerned about, they have yielded very few viable proposals and are falling into greater and greater disrepair each year. We believe that making this new space available on the South Island will stimulate interest in North Island, encouraging tenants to propose combinations of both historic rehabilitation and new construction. It will also assure the potential users of the historic buildings that the island will have the infrastructure, audience, and year-round access necessary to support their activities. Uh, so we support the Thank you very much. and the approach. Sorry, thank you. Lucian's, you gotta be, no offense intended, you gotta be a little tighter on the button. We're gonna go to Jeff and it's spelled uh, Chetarico, perhaps I've pronounced that right, I hope I have. After Chet, we're going to do Taylor Banning and Wendy Brawer. So that gives you the lineup coming up. Jeff is from the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the students, teachers, staff of the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. My name is Jeff Shaturko. I'm the principal of this amazing high school located on Governor's Island. We like to thank the Governor's Island Trust and all the members of their team of this awe-inspiring island who are able to allow us to provide an exceptional hands-on maritime education curriculum to a diverse student population and help break them into the maritime job field after graduation. There is no secret that while we aim to provide this unique program to our students, our school community feels that we have not been properly supported by New York City Department of Education to reach our goals. We've communicated for years that a maritime school, harbor school requires additional specific resources like a pool, additional space, appropriate funding for equipment and work-based learning opportunities. Not having these resources would be like trying to run a theater program with an auditorium or an art school with an, without additional funding for paint. And now when Governor's Island, our home is looking to bring a climate center to the island, we couldn't be more excited uh, to support this work. We are excited about the potential it brings to further develop our own school's growth this vision aligns with our school's mission in educating our diverse city around climate change while continuing our restoration work around the New York Harbor with our students and staff alongside the Billion Oyster Project. Claire Newman and her team have shown an overwhelming commitment to our school community that Harbor School can be one of the public programs to work in conjunction with the Climate Center, as well as opening the door to potentially work with an incoming university or research institution which could offer internship and post-secondary opportunities for our own students and for all public school students in our city. It is our hope that New York City Department of Education can recognize this as an opportunity to engage in conversations with the Governor's Island Trust and our school community to grow and align our work with the city's need to increase our maritime education and climate restoration development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. We're going to go to Taylor Banning and Wendy Brawler. If I've said those correctly, I apologize. Taylor, you're next. We'll wait for Good you evening to be unmuted. And can you hear me? Thank you. Yep. Good evening and happy holidays. Thank you all so much. I oppose this governor's island rezoning. I'm actually offended this is being proposed during a pandemic and a housing crisis. It's asking for millions of taxpayer funds. Um, and I believe all these funds, all funds available now should go towards housing our neighbors in need um, of housing right now. And in that vein, um, 
I think we, and I call upon CB1 um, to support housing relief legislation and urge our electeds to bring those bills to the floor for a vote as soon as possible, including um, bills put forth by Yuli Nu, Salazar, Myri, Reyes, um, to end evic the eviction moratorium, or to extend the eviction moratorium and extend it for a year after the end of the emergency, um, and Kavanaugh's bills to provide housing vouchers, um, we need rent and mortgage relief as soon as possible. Every New Yorker has the right to a safe and stable home. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, Wendy Brower, B-R-A-W-E-R. -E Wendy, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Wendy Brower, a 30 year resident of the Lower East Side. This year I volunteered weekly on Governor's Island at Earth Matter and helped grow a ton of produce for soup kitchens on one eighth of an acre. In a future food emergency, open space on Governor's Island could be com converted to keep New Yorkers from starving, literally. And in good times, fancy farm to table dinners and circular economy training programs could help keep the island afloat, as could active water features and pools, an art gallery, a bike culture center, solar energy, and other productive engagements. Without years of taxpayer funded construction on more needless high rise buildings, Governor's Island would return plenty on investment in terms of climate mitigation, ecosystem services, public health benefits, and a reduction of net of nature deficit disorder. All New Yorkers have a positive association with Governor's Island's unique natural environment. Governor's Island is our country place in the city. This even, and I'm, I'm a Lower East Side resident, and you know, even after COVID, Governor's Island's gonna be a lifesaver for my community. 165,000 of us are gonna be impacted for years to come by the two massive storm surge uh, projects that will close much of East River Park and this riverside south to the, all the way south to the seaport. So this, but this precious green space belongs to all New Yorkers and should not be seeded away from future generations. I urge CB1 and all council members to vote against rezoning Governor's Island. Moreover, keep the seaport historic at 120 feet or less. Thank you so much to CB1 for keeping the keeping downtown authentic. Thank you, and Governor's Island. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. I'd like to say Governor's Island is downtown, so it is a part and parcel to who we are. Um, I know that Michael Kettering has a statement on behalf of the Downtown Alliance. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Meltzer and the rest of the board for allowing the Downtown Alliance to speak in support of Governor Island rezoning proposal before you tonight. The Alliance believes strongly that the Climate Solutions Center on the island would help address two major crises the city faces, the economic threat posed by COVID-19 and the impending threat of climate change. We understand and acknowledge that the board has serious concerns about the proposal and the impact it will have on New Yorkers' experience on the island and for the city. As you, we want the island to continue to provide New Yorkers with a place to safely bike, walk, picnic, and generally enjoy the outdoors. We believe that the proposed Climate Solutions Center, which is projected to bring um, to the city 8,000 direct jobs and 1 billion in fiscal benefits for New York, would help fund and therefore preserve the park, leading to many more years of the kind of outdoor recreation that brings so many people to Governor's Island. Not to mention, of course, the literal preservation of the outdoors and the kind of climate change research spearheaded on the island, which it could provide for us. The community board has identified a number of areas it believes need further consideration, such as permitted uses, open space regulations, density bulk height in parking regulations, and environmental sustainability. We urge the trust to continue working closely with community board one to address and resolve these issues. In regards to the proposal before you today, we encourage the board to pass a resolution that is in favor of the project subject to further review of the concerns articulated by community board board one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, Todd, let's 
see. Ay, ay, ay. I apologize. Going back through. Todd Fine on Governor's Island, I believe. As president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which focuses on the Little Syria neighborhood, I want to express opposition to rezoning Governor's Island. The Euler Tammy, process... can it be heard? Can you hear me? I can hear him. Yes, the Euler can process Turn is your not speak. functioning right now. He's a little low. Parties yeah. among the public are overwhelmed by economic problems, family worries, and health issues. Yet the city hall is using the pandemic to push some of the most divisive and unpopular zoning matters in years with Soho, the seaport, and Governor's Island. DCP hearings are badly managed and artificially controlled. The public process is not functioning, and this controlled process is giving advantages to advocates with the greatest financial interest, as we see tonight. Long-term planning is also impossible with so many unknowns in the future. The community board in its 15-page resolution has thought seriously about this issue, but this issue should be rejected simply because the ULR process needs to be delayed. The community board should amend the resolution to make this clear and stop this, this type of uh, city planning. I also want to speak on the Seaport Museum. I ask members to reject the second resolution that supports the John Street expansion for the Seaport. While the Water Street building is clearly outrageous, the John Street building also has serious problems. Its land hasn't been transferred over to the museum, and the, and the museum suggests it will still be named after a billionaire donor. The design of the John Street building should not be a rushed amalgamation of gimmicks designed by Howard Hughes' architects to impress politicians, but it should be part of a larger reevaluation of the purpose of the museum that incorporates the history of slavery, black lives, global commerce, imperialism, and the natural environment. Vaguely, vaguely mimicking the copper tiling on ships, the shutters on some surrounding buildings or the arches on the Fulton Ferry building or the Battery Maritime building does not inform historical understanding, which is the underlying purpose of the preservation regime. The design manifests gimmickry and elect elevator pitches for politicians. I suggest one of the main reasons for the museum, museum's budget problems, it has failed as an institution to interpret the history of New York's port in ways that are relevant to new generation of tourists and New Yorkers. Instead, if they need, need to seek uh, to construct a new building, they should include other ideas that have been extinguished from the current environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. I'm going to Ann McDermott. Amy, I don't see that person online. Okay, Roger Manning. Mr. Manning does not appear to have a microphone plugged in. I can't unmute him. Can you uh, text with him to get text uh, tech support to him, please? Um, Janine Lawler. I do okay, not see Janine. Roger Manning says that they're on the phone. Let me just pull them up and unmute them on the phone. One moment. Okay, great. Thank you. You know what? While you're working on him, uh, from the trust for Governor's Island is here. Can we, uh, Claire? Do you mind unmuting Claire, and we'll we'll come back to Roger once we get that figured out. Yep. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Tammy. Tammy, do you want me to read the letter or a shorter statement? Uh, the letter we're going to share uh, publicly okay. uh, that was that was received today, and we will post a link to it in the chat Much for all board members and everybody to see. So whatever you feel is perfect, we'll give you the same amount of time that the electeds had. How's that? Sounds good. Because um, you're only you're only one person. You did not bring the uh, entire board with you. <laughs> uh, yes, Richard. F fair is fair. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Claire Newman, President and CEO of the Trust for Governors Island. I want to thank uh, you, Tammy, the staff, and all of you at Manhattan Community Board One for the significant time you've invested over the past four months in reviewing our application for the proposed South Island rezoning and for your ongoing commitment to the future of Governors Island. Our mission at the Trust is to ensure that Governor's Island continues to be a vibrant resource for New Yorkers. Over 20 years of advocacy and careful planning have laid the groundwork in transforming the island from a former military base into an unparalleled resource for Lower Manhattan and the entire city. 
including the construction of its award-winning park, its year-round educational, cultural, and commercial tenants, and work with dozens of partner organizations. Now we have a remarkable opportunity to deliver on the promise of Governor's Island as an even more accessible resource that is open and vibrant year round. As stewards of this place, we have the responsibility not only to maintain the park, but to ensure that more New Yorkers can enjoy it through expanded transportation, enhancing and expanding its recreational facilities and field space, creating more educational and cultural opportunities, and attracting uses that support the same vibrancy in winter as we have in the summer months and breathing life into our nearly 50 historic buildings. The proposed South Island rezoning will support that mission as well as our vision to attract a leading center for climate solutions that will celebrate the island's unique waterfront location and create a first of its kind cross disciplinary educational program, which will offer broad opportunities for public education and engagement and cement New York City as a global leader around one of the greatest challenges of our time. This proposal aligns uses allowed on the South Island development sites, which are currently zoned for residential with uses permitted by the deed and long envisioned for the island. It also adds further protection and expands the island's open space, none of which is going away. Throughout this process, we've heard a number of concerns from the community and we have heard you and have appreciated the constructive feedback. We share your desire to make sure Governor's Island remains a beloved and unique resource and are committed to working with you on these concerns during the next stages of the ULERT process, including making adjustments to height and density consistent with our goals for financial sustainability. That will allow us to increase public accessibility year round. We also want to show our commitment now by immediately addressing some of the concerns we heard around open space protections, the definition of base plane, and the community board's role in the planning and process for future solicitations. So today we sent a letter to Community Board 1 outlining our commitments. First, in section 134.112, permitted uses in the open space, we are removing all uses in use group 15 to eliminate concerns around Coney Island's style amusements. We're changing all use groups in 13 are gonna be required to be open to the sky, not enclosed. And we're changing the rules around eating and drinking establishments to ensure that they're under 200 people with no dancing. Um, we are also changing the height restrictions in that area from 35 to 25 feet. All of this will be done in the zoning. We also commit to resolving how the base plane is defined. We're working with Department of City Planning on that right now to take out all ambiguity and make sure that there are no ways for uh, folks to take advantage of that in the future. Last and really important, we are committed to ensuring in partnership with the community board that there is significant engagement around the future RFP for a center for climate solutions. Community board one will continue to work with us on identifying goals and we commit to presenting finalist proposals at a public meeting so the community board can provide feedback on the future anchor institutions program design and more. Again, it has been a pleasure to work with you all and behalf of all of us. We thank you for your continued dedication and we look forward to continuing this partnership throughout the Euler process and beyond. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you to the Governor's Island team and to everybody who is um, every one of the office staff, everyone, which is Lucy, Diana, Jen, Lucian, and to Alice, my vice chair, and every single board member who has sat through all of the presentations. This has been um, a very unprecedented time, which seems not as meaningful of a word as it used to be, just saying. Okay, let's get back to thank you. Uh, we will take a look in the chat that our team has been posting. The letter will be included in that. Okay, all right, let's move on to sign-ins about Governor's I have, uh, Island. I have Roger Manning here on the phone. Okay. Great, thank you, Lucian. Roger Manning, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you folks hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. Hi, I'm Roger Manning, a co-founder of MAGIC, the Metro Area Governor's Island Coalition, a pretty new organization of people who've been around the Governor's Island stuff for quite a while. Um, the trust for Governor's Island pitch sounds great. I mean, 
I would agree with a lot of that stuff, but it, it's, uh, well, Community Board 1 needs to vote no on the current trust for Governor's Island rezoning proposal in order to send a strong message in the mural process. Uh, this plan is not about funding Governor's Island. It's not about a climate research hub. It's essentially a real estate deal with no formal requirement for an academic tenant. Uh, and that it will replace an obtrusive mass of buildings in the only public space of, the, of its kind in New York City or, or, or anywhere, really. Um, this lowering the building heights from 30, uh, 300 to 20, to, you know, 300 feet to 250 feet, we kind of almost expected that. They, you know, let's, let's throw out a red herring, put up big building heights, and then give them something less, and then the opponents something less, and they'll be, you know, happy with that. But um, the resulting development from this proposal will not fund Governor's Island for many years to come. And in fact, it'll cost taxpayers millions during that period. Uh, and presentation of alternative approaches has been inadequate. And it's a blanket rezoning that subjects all existing parklands to a future, to, uh, you know, potential future takeover. And it fails to accommodate current tenants such as uh, Earth Matter, Bro NYC, and, and even the Harbor School. Um, you know, no one's saying that those development zones shouldn't have something in them, but uh, this, this this current proposal is way too much. And you keep hearing it, 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 Magic also fully supports the Seaport Coalition's position to not break zoning in that historic neighborhood, where you're hearing a similar pattern of uh, we need reliable re, uh, reliable recurrent income. And um, it, I don't buy it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, next we're going to go to Emily Hellstrom on the topic of Governor's Island. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you so much. I can, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Um, my name is Emily Hellstrom and I'm a member of Children First um, and I'm speaking today on um, Governor's Island. We are at a dangerous crossroads in our city where the temptation and pressure to monetize our public spaces is greater than at any other time in a generation. Like Jane Jacobs, Kent Farwick, Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, and the hundreds, possibly thousands of other preservationists and activists who come before us, those who embody the meaning of the words public and preservation, I believe we must slow down and take a hard look at what we are giving away and what we are gaining. At 250 Water Street, we have a developer who thinks it's okay to build at towering heights within a low-rise district to break one of our first historic districts, as long as they promise money to a laudable but private institution. With Governor's Island, we are in danger of falling into a trap of an enormous giveaway of public land to private developers in return for something that may be able to achieve be achieved in other ways without big real estate front and center. Both of these are massive and highly complicated changes in land use happening very quickly, a rush to completion before three term limited elective officials move on. All of this during an unprecedented global pandemic. As we have seen with the arcades on Water Street, with the Pier 17 and countless other examples downtown and around our city, when we marry the public and the private time and again, the private slowly but decidedly cannibalizes the public. This is not to say it cannot be done, but a giant red flag is waving. Community, Community Board One, I thank you for your service. Say no to towers at 250 Water Street and forgive my grammar, go slow on Governor's Island. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... I am looking down the list to see if there's anybody else from any other topics. I have Anne McDermott. I don't know if she's here. I don't think she is. Okay. I think at this point it, we have heard from plenty of people. I'm not sure if um, Controller Stringer's representative or Congressman Nadler's representative would like to speak this evening. Um, in all due diligence, it is eight o'clock and I am 
planning on closing the public session. I apologize if you had not had a chance to speak yet, but we had very robust dialogue on 250 water. I think that we do not need any other dialogue. Please feel free to write your comments and testimony in by email. We did have email testimony available for a very long time. And with that, I'm closing the public session. I don't hear from Luke or Hannah. Oh, Jim, can you check with them, please? Hi, sorry. Oh, Luke, hi. oh yeah, sorry about that. And after you, you're both okay. here. Take your turns, two minutes each. Hi, everyone. Um, I will be very brief. I just wanted to make sure to um, hop on tonight just because um, the big stimulus. Uh, coronavirus relief and omnibus package finally passed yesterday by Congress. So I just wanted to uh, just go over a few top line items. We know that the bill is not nearly enough. Obviously, this is a first step and the congressman um, is encouraged to continue to fighting for more relief to address the bill's shortcomings in the new administration. I tried to flag a few things. So uh, folks will get $600 um, in direct relief for those earning under $75,000, 600 for each child dependent. Um, unemployment insurance is extended to 50 weeks or until March 14th, 2021. Uh, the PUA, so if folks that were ineligible normally for relief, um, that is still available. And the additional funding is $300 a week. Uh, the bill also includes $4 billion for the MTA. Um, something to flag for this district is that the Water Resources Development Act was included, which funds the coastal storm study so that it can resume immediately and it's funded in full. Um, something new uh, is the Save Our Stages Act. That includes grants for shared venue operators. Um, th th all of these things, I'm happy to come back to the board and explain everything in more detail. We just got the bill last night. Things are going to get rolled out. The agencies have to go through it um, and then give us guidance. And then they'll let us know when deadlines and applications are available. So I just wanted to flag that. Um, in terms of PPP, there's new provisions designed to benefit restaurant owners. There's expanded PPP eligibility, which will now make uh, housing co-ops eligible for the program. There's also um, applicants will be able to apply once again. Um, so again, we are just getting all the information. The congressman will be sending out a newsletter in the coming days or weeks. Um, additionally, call our office if you have any questions. I will come back to the board and update you when I can about each of the programs. I'm happy to come to committees and I'm happy to leave my email in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to call. Happy holidays and nice to see everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you so much, Hannah. Luke, you're next. And then Cora Fung is going to close it out from Council Member Chin. And before you go, Luke, I have to give an honest apology to Cora. She was one of the first five people who signed on today. <laughs> I made her wait until the very last. So, I, Luke, take I'm, it away. Before Luke Chantel Cabrera for Senator Kavanaugh's office, also, I'll go after Cora. Oh, my gosh. And hello, Chantel. There you go. Luke, Cora, and then Chantel. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will keep this brief. My name is Luke Wolf from City Controller Scott Schrinner's office. I um, just want to come on and start by wishing everyone a happy holidays and give a big thank you on behalf of the controller of the board. I know uh, it's been an unusual year and know how hard you all have worked uh, this past year to uh, keep the community safe and healthy and uh, informed and protected and all the other things. So a big thank you. Um, I will drop more in the chat to share, but one thing I do want to roll out from our office is we announced a uh, small business package, which I know is something the board has worked a lot on, really around supporting small business around the holidays. So it pushed the city to come up with a plan to uh, really assist those small businesses, develop an online presence right now, ramp up holiday markets and outdoor festivals so New Yorkers can shop uh, at those local businesses, work with designers in the manufacturing sector to make sure we're producing things locally, use Link NYC business uh, to promote local businesses. Um, we have a whole plan, which I'll drop in the chat, which we're pushing uh, to make sure those mom and pops stay uh, afloat during this tough time. I'll also drop my contact information if there's anything our office can do over the holidays. Uh, we hope you all have some fun celebrating as much as we can this year, but if there are any challenges, please feel free to reach out to our office anytime. I'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Wow, thank you, Luke. Appreciate it. That goes Cora and then Chantel. Cora Fung from Council Member Chin's office. And can you make sure she's unmuted, please? Yes. Hi, Cora. I Hi. can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Hi. Do you hear me? I do. Oh, okay. I do. 
<laughs> Thank you. Cora, so we yes. can hear you. All right, I'm here. And um, Tammy, I also need uh, a minute extra because Council Member Chin wants to make a comment on the Urban Assembly in New York Harbor School. But I do want everyone to know, all the nonprofits, that it's budget season. It will be posted on the City Council's website on January the 5th. And I'll remind you. Uh, we're also joining Borough President Gail Brewer's helicopter task force to tackle the situation. And we continue to support tenants who are faced with evictions. And we work with other electors to preserve affordable housing. Now, uh, Tammy, with the two minutes from Council Member Chin about the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School, many of us know that the students who are in the profession diving school, they must trek to a pool in Brooklyn to complete their curriculum. So when budget time came and the school asked for a container pool, Council Member Chin was very happy to work with the speaker's office and secure a $1.1 million for it in the fiscal year 2019. Now we were told that a temporary pool is not, is going to be very difficult because of the requirements around capital funding and accessibility. But on the bright side, however, it's possible that a permanent aquatic facility can be incorporated into this new school expansion plan as part of the Governor's Island rezoning. So for many years, the council members has been working with the Trust for Governor's Island, the school PDA, the school construction authority on this, and she has been playing a coordinated role and we will continue to do so. We will work with Governor's Island we want to work together to come up with a plan that makes sense, not only for the school expansion, but also to include the aquatic facility. After all, it's not just the students who would be using the pool. It's been suggested that the new aquatic facility may also be made available to summer visitors. So we believe that we are moving in the right direction. Council Member Chin also wants to commend the Harbor School's efforts in environmental education to combat climate change. And thank you all community board members and your loved ones who share the time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy, for the extra time. And Cora, I am so sorry. I know you were here early. I totally apologize. All right, Chantal, take us home, please. Senator Kavanaugh's team. All righty, thank you for having me and thank you for convening today, everybody. Uh, the Senator is working tirelessly to make sure that uh, the needs of many New Yorkers are being met in regards to housing and ensuring that they're protected from evictions. Uh, if you haven't uh, been made aware, uh, last week, Friday, the uh, oh my, emergency rent relief program was expanded and reopened, so anyone who had submitted an application will be reassessed uh, if they were denied and uh, any New Yorker can apply who has been rent burdened until February uh, 1st. Uh, initially that that was CARES funding $100 million before the expansion only $40 million was used so we are trying to use up the remaining $60 million. Uh, we continue to uh, distribute PPE during these times. So if you have an, an agency or a need for uh, masks or sanitizer, please let myself know, Chantel Cabrera, um, at Senator Kavanaugh's office, and we'll make sure to get you some PPE. And just wishing everyone a wonderful and safe holiday season. Make sure you ascribe yourself to the core four. Um, it, it's very enticing to be together, but we really need to keep each other safe and also enjoy the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we are going to close the public session. It is 812. We've had robust dialogue and engagement. I apologize if you attended and you wanted to speak and didn't get to, but I do believe there has been a fair hearing for everything that has been said thus far. And we do have a large session in front of us. So with that, I'm closing the public session. And if I could get the agenda back up, for the board. Okay, can I get a motion to um, 
approve the November minutes I'll from, uh, let me first of all, thank you. Second, anyone? Thank you. Do I hear any nays or abstentions or recusals? With none being heard, we are adopting the November minutes. Um, before we go into our district manager's report, welcome back Lucian Reynolds from his paternity leave, which we are excited to have him back in one of the busiest months Community Board 1 has ever seen. Um, and I want to note for the public, the public does not get recognized during the business session. This is the official start of our business session. So going forward, we would not be recognizing members of the general public. This is board only discussion from this point. You're welcome to stay with us. We hope you do. So you can hear the ongoings for Community Board 1 and our final vote. And with that, Lucian, welcome back and take it away. Thanks, Tammy. Much appreciated. Um, thanks for everyone for bearing with me. This has been a huge meeting, which is capping off, as Tammy said, a huge month for CB1. Um, I have my son right next to my head, so you may hear baby sounds as I talk right in my ear pods. So um, just a reminder to all of our members of the meeting that hosting uh, privileges goes back and forth between members of the staff, and it may take a bit of time to move you over from attendees to panelists. Um, we're going to try to do as fast as we can, and uh, we know you want to engage. So uh, just let you know that we, we do as fast as we can. A lot of windows to, to shuffle. Um, many of you have already heard the Deputy Inspector Figueroa, the first precinct, was promoted and given a new assignment, which means the first precinct has a new commanding officer and Captain Thomas Smith. We expect to meet with him uh, as soon as he is settled in. Uh, early in the month, I had a call with the first precinct's newly minted crime prevention officer, Michael Erdman. We discussed ways that CB1 could aid him in disseminating information about crime trends, as well as providing him an opportunity to connect with CB1 and our guests at the Quality of Life Committee sometime in the future. So I'll be talking with Pat, and uh, we'll be sure to have him come in to meet everyone and uh, figure out how we can all work together. We should expect to hear more uh, as soon as he and Captain Smith um, uh, get some get some of their training and and uh, understanding of their uh, uh, work ahead of them. CB1 is now uploading every new meeting to our YouTube page. I encourage all CB1 members as well as the public to subscribe to our page so you will know when new meetings are available to watch. All meetings have transcripts that are generated from WebEx and Otter IO um, or AI, so they are accessible to those who rely on subtitles. The transcript is only available in English right now, sadly. Over the coming months, we will be working to put older meetings on YouTube with the transcripts for public consumption as well. I included a link to last month's full board meeting on the remote meetings portal at live.mcb1.nyc. So if you need help finding our YouTube page, just have a look there. If you still have trouble, please email me at lureynolds at cb.nyc.gov and I'll uh, do whatever I can. Oh, oh my gosh, right in my ear. I'll do whatever I can to uh, to get you there. <laughs> the failure of the federal government to provide relief funds for states and municipalities is being felt across budgets at every level in New York State. Here at CB1, we were already asked, asked to identify money for a budget cut at the beginning of this year, and now we're asked to accommodate another um, slightly smaller cut. Luckily, we left ourselves a cushion and will not need to make any drastic changes. Other community boards around the city uh, have a, a larger challenge ahead of them. Uh, we wish them uh, the best. We will work with Mariama, uh, our treasurer, to respond to NYC Office of Management and Budget and include the information in the next upcoming treasurer's report. And I want to give a special thanks to Diana Sweetai for her incredible work in coordinating a massive number of land use projects over the last two months. Well done, Diana. It's been uh, just an insane uh, 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 60 days. Uh, between all the ULERP and the and the landmarks and all the connected actions, um, just tip of the hat to you. And with that, Tammy, I conclude my report. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Lucian. It's really good to have you back. All right, let's go to the chairperson's report. And as typical from the conversations we've had on this board, my chairperson's report is super short. That obviously is the largest conversations of what we had during the public session, and here we are represented with it again. And next slide. 
Ooh, dinner just got delivered. Okay, meetings that I've been to on behalf of the community this month. We are not in my lovely building at 1 Center Street. I do miss being in the office. I just can't say that enough. Uh, we had the Hudson River Advisory Board since we met the Downtown Alliance Board meeting the Battery Conservancy, the Climate Coalition, which we'll get more into later, the Climate Center for Governor's Island, and Francis Curtis, thank you so much for attending the Mayor's Office um, Forum on Testing and Tracing. She will be our contact on that lead going forward. Obviously, Borough Board every month. And then I gave testimony at the City Planning Scoping Meeting for the environmental impact on 250 Water. Um, please stay tuned for January. We have the borough based jails uh, mayoral representative who canceled due to snow this month will be returning in January. Laura Dodge is returning in January. We hope to receive the, the report from the environmental review in full um, to be discussed for 250 water. Um, borough board in January will take the full board vote on the zoning for coastal flood resiliency. Not all boards have opined officially, as you know, we are tonight and there are many more boards that are doing it the first week in January. Stay tuned for an email from Pat. We may be virtual 2020 has been a year like no other, but as usual, we will have our holiday get together. However, it will be virtual. So take a look for that. And with that, I complete my chair's report and let's get moving into the business session. Oh, thank you all. Here's where I forgot. Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy New Year. I think I've got them all covered, but the two pictures to me illustrate everything because we wanna see you all from the close up that we have to as far back as you can pull from the lights. We all have different visions, but we have to work together as a community. So I appreciate every single member of the board, the incredible team at the office, and the public engagement this year has been outstanding. We hope that they stick with us as we look forward and rebuild Lower Manhattan from this pandemic to be a more vibrant and beautiful place than it was even in March of this year. So thank you, and with that, I really am done. <sighs> So let's get the zoning for coastal flood resiliency resolution. Diana, do you mind? Um, we went through the, there we go. Um, it is a large resolution. I am hoping everyone has had a chance to read it or to attend any one of the numerous meetings that ha we have had these dialogues in. This process has a yes, a no, a yes with conditions and a no with conditions. The, com the committee vote was for the zoning for coastal resiliency, a no with conditions. So what does that mean, unfavorable with conditions? Unfavorable with conditions means that we're asking the city to meet all the conditions and then it would be a yes. But it stays as a no unless all the conditions are met. Why is that important? It is important to know because it's not the only one that we go through like this. So please, if any board members have questions on the zoning for coastal resilience, therefore be it resolved or anything as we go forward, please let me know. Raise your hand. Tom, you can unmute, there you go. Tom, zoning for coastal resiliency question. With conditions is a yes vote, correct? With con a unfavorable with conditions means that they need to meet all of the conditions that we set out. And if so, then it's, it's positive. It's not, then it stays as unfavorable. And so, yes vote for that means you support that, correct? You. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> Anything else? Rosa, Chang, and Tom, if you can take your hand down after. Thank you. Um, just wanted to propose a friendly amendment to uh, page six, second from the last whereas, as well as page eight on the third bullet point. Um, there is a cost to uh, water proofing and dry proofing um, space. And there is also a cost if you're if you're not quite able to use that space in the way that you would like. So even for new development, while I um, have always said that new development should not be treated the same as existing um, 
buildings in terms of coastal resiliency, I do believe that there is a cost that we're not taking into consideration here when we're saying that um, it we shouldn't um, give new development anything at all. I just think that we should give them significantly less. Um, I also think that there is a difference in how this impacts the bottom line for new development, whether it is a block, a large block site, like we're talking about at 250 Water or Governor's Island versus a smaller you know, urban site that might be like 20 feet by 100 feet um, that impacts those projects very greatly differently, um, financially speaking. So I would request that we give some consideration to the scale of the project when it's a new development as well as um, as well as give something because there is a cost associated with the coastal resiliency requirements now. Just not not nothing, I'm saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I can't I can't hear you. You're muted. Tammy, I can't hear you. Tammy, you're have do you have do you have verbiage that you are suggesting? Um yes. Okay, do you want me to get it? Hold on. Um the verbiage would be that uh, CB1 urges this proposed, oh wait, um, the CB1 urges this proposed zoning text to apply in full to existing buildings and in reduced part to new buildings. So that is in the therefore be it resolved. And that's existing buildings. Only that, and it's, not new um, buildings. That Right, that is what we passed at committee. So we did say that we urged financial options for buildings through grants and texts and things like that, which new buildings would still be able to qualify for. Does that change I, I what you not, are saying? Actually, because I believe on page six, second from the last whereas, as well as that bullet point that you were just at, um, they specifically exclude new buildings from any benefit. Well, I'd need to hear more from committee members. I'll, I'm not saying yes or no I on would that. I'm going to no. go to, I'll, I'll come back. I would vote uh, no on that. Sorry. Thank you, Sue. That's okay. Okay, Susan. I, I usually I'm gonna listen to, to Rosa. They're going to get their deals no matter what. It's all going to happen. But I think we have to be very strong on this amendment. And I think it, I'm concerned about the existing. The developers will always figure it out. I don't have to be their advocate on this one. Thank you. Uh, well said, Ms. Susan. Thanks, Susan. I agree. Let's go to Patrick and then Mark and then Colin. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, just as the chair of the land use committee, I, I wanted to uh, make a quick distinction between a yes with conditions and a no with conditions, which is we're calling an approval with the conditions or a disapproval with conditions. There, um, it, 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 it's a hard thing that we struggle with all the time, but um, there is a difference. And in my mind, um, when we're looking at these applications in the way that we've always treated them, um, is whether the applicant has shown a need or not. The conditions are going to be there one way or the other. So while you say no, unless you meet every single one of these conditions, I think human nature is to tend toward that. But if that you accept that there is some need, that the applicant has said that there is some need, in this case, zoning for coastal resiliency, that there is a change in the zoning that is needed to accommodate for coastal resiliency measures, which I happen to believe there is, they've met that need. You, you, you would want to cast this in my view as a, a, an approval with conditions because the approval can't trigger unless all of those conditions are met. So what you're saying is, yes, I agree the applicant has met a need for a change in the zoning. There is something that needs to be done differently, but it needs to be done in a different way. And the only way that we would agree with it is if it meets X, Y, Z, A, B, C, those conditions. Uh, so I can appreciate that people 
struggle with the distinction between the two, but um, I, I think it sends a, a, a very different message if you say disapprove with conditions, especially on something as important, I think, as this. I, I don't think that any of us really would dispute that there is a need for um, rezoning in the coastal resiliency context. And so I would encourage people to think about that. And, and I don't know if that ultimately works its way into an amendment of this uh, uh, resolution or, or a, a nay vote on it, but that's a comment I had. Thank that's, you. that's not the way that it was explained to us. So the, the, I, I hear where you're going, but we took, a, we took a fairly strong stand on here, right? And it does say that we recognize resiliency is, is needed, but this particular zoning amendment, the way it is structured with the concept, if you look in the therefore be it resolves, that talks about there's a difference between doing zoning and doing financial incentives through zoning. And that's yeah, where that. this zoning application in the way that it was came down in this vote. Because no, the group in general did not approve of this amendment. It doesn't mean that it couldn't change, which is a conversation that we had at Borough Board because there were lots of people looking for change. It's just, this is where we landed. And quite frankly, it would have been great to have them come to the community board anytime since 2017 and talk to us about the potentials and how it affects community board one, but we've not had any engaged dialogue until they already went into the process. No doubt. And all of that, I think, goes to the conditions. All I'm saying is a, as, a, as, as a matter of how we've treated land use applications over the years, the, the slight distinction between a yes with conditions and a no with conditions, and Tammy, I respect what you just said, but when you said that someone, that's not what you were told, I, I think I know where that's coming from, but if that's coming from a polite explanation by DCP, I don't think they're necessarily saying it with the oomph that, that really the, we, we have treated it as a committee and as a community board over the years. That's the reason for my comment, and that's why I, I offered it. It's not to criticize the, the, okay. the rationale behind the conditions, which I think are right. All right, Mark, Amoruso, and then Colin. Yeah, I was going to kind of actually say about the opposite, kind of what you said earlier, um, uh, Tammy. Uh, sometimes when we put these conditions in, we do we we, we take a lot of time and effort to to. Uh, to you know, come up with the language to craft these conditions, and they're not just put there, you know, arbitrarily. But I think where where we kind of say in this page twelve, CB one strongly believes it it, can, it leaves a door open that uh, well, uh, they strongly believe it. Maybe we can meet some of the conditions. Maybe we can't. Don't have to. I think it should just be worded uh, as as you said it uh that uh these conditions are not uh mitigations and conditions are not met uh it should be considered a rejection just uh, just add that language to the to the last line of that <clears throat> just to be clear it wasn't a straight it wasn't it but mark it wasn't a straight rejection a straight rejection is unfavorable this was not a straight rejection no i mean i mean if the conditions uh that we are putting forth are not met then it should be considered a rejection um i hear where you're going um colin and alice yeah just to get back to the point that's on the floor the friendly amendment that's been proposed just to double down on on susan's point i agree when i initially suggested tax credits it was for people who don't necessarily have the ability to adapt not for new uh, construction, as we've seen tonight, there's no shortage of desire to build new buildings. I'm not in any mood to give uh, developers more tax incentives. So I agree with Susan. Okay, Alice. I just want to offer up a, a rather simple formula that I sometimes use, and it could be incorrect, but you know, sometimes we get stuck with this sort of yes, no, and basically, if you basically think the zoning as written is something you approve of, then you'd be voting. Right, yes, pure yes or a yes, and a couple of things need to change. If you basically look at this and think the zoning is not something that you approve of, 
then you would be voting a straight no, absolutely not under no circumstance, or no, there are things that need to be changed. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but I think yes means yes and no means no, you know, and I think that's, I don't know, that's just something I'm offering up as a uh, another interpretation. Thanks. Okay, do I have any other committee members who want to talk on this? Tom, you had your hand up, but I don't know if you are planning on speaking or not. Tom? Yes, I had my hey. hand up since, uh, since when I got muted just as I was about to speak in the public session. So I, I just never oh. pulled it back. Okay, so. sorry. Did you want to add anything contextually to the zoning? No, no. Okay. All right, great. Um, so back to the three points where we started with Rosa. Can you go to therefore be it resolved? Tammy, Tammy one second. Okay, Tammy, isn't yep. she proposing an amendment? She is proposing a friendly amendment, which I am going to decline for the whereas. Okay. And ask and ask her if within the therefore be it resolved where we ask for them to find um, increased savings that could be realized by new owners additional there was where is the diana where's the part about the additional funding sources so this one here cb1 urges the city to provide clear comprehensive funding options Um, I think it's CP1 encourages the city to further study connection and potential of increased insurance savings that could be realized by building owners who, and then the question is, Rosa, would you be comfortable if it goes in there who complete a retrofit or build new to be more resilient? So it doesn't fall within the zoning, it falls within exterior to the zoning. No, to me, those are separate issues. The problem is that the resolution, as it's written, believes that the zoning should only apply to existing buildings, not new ones, meaning that you don't get a fiscal bonus or additional floor area exemption beyond what's already been there. So. What you're asking for is a change in what the resolution is. Because the resolution supports all of the zoning for coastal resiliency for buildings that are retrofitting. For new buildings, it does not support the area, the floor area bonus and exemptions. Right, nor the height differential. Correct. Nor, yes, nor any financial whatever happens. What Correct. Developed in the future. Correct. Um, Correct. And, I, and your I your don't... friendly amendment changes all of that. The only place that it would fit in, based on the existing structure of what was done in the committee, is to be able to find insurance benefits and other benefits that new buildings could qualify for. But putting in what you're asking changes the intent of the resolution from committee. If you don't agree, that's fine. You can vote against it. That's your choice. Okay. I don't agree. Okay, so when we call the vote, we go. Uh, Jeff Galloway, your hand is up. Uh, yes. Um, as I understood the presentations, the application of the zoning um, bonuses, so to speak, um, uh, which would apply to new buildings as well as uh, retrofits, was in part to incentivize better um, streetscapes uh, that in other words if all you had to do is meet the building code for resiliency you could do things to the ground floor that wouldn't look particularly good from the street level but would satisfy the building code requirements for resiliency um, and 
uh, part of the motivation for granting this extra 10 feet, so to speak, was for a better treatment at the street level. How did you, I was unfortunately not able to meet the executive committee. How, how did you deal with that uh, issue in the resolution, um, uh, if you did? I can let Alice or Diana speak to that, but I believe there are other provisions that cover that. Part of it is in the other, so Diana or Alice. I'm going to have to defer to Diana on it because um, I don't have it up in front of me and I really would have to dive in a little bit so I can get back to you, but I couldn't respond right right here now. Sorry, maybe Diana can. Because part of the presentation I mean, that they gave to us. Is that... Thanks, Diana. Diana, is there is there zoning that currently exists to improve street fronts beyond this text amendment? Well, uh, well yeah, more, more specifically. Some of the things that you would need to do on the ground floor uh, in order to earn, you know, in terms of waterproofing the ground floor, in terms of earning the 10 feet, was to make the ground floor uh, presentable uh, at, at the street level. Um, and they had some experience of what they described as gaming the system uh, by uh, builders of new construction, you know, since Sandy, when the interim measures came in that satisfied uh, the building code uh, resiliency and also satisfied the temporary uh, modifications to zoning, but in fact involved, you know, like these I don't know, five foot high first, first floors, that was what was made waterproof, uh, which basically eliminated kind of the sidewalk level frontage of these buildings that they were trying to encourage. And that was one of the things that was supposedly being fixed in the, in the text amendment. But if, if this zoning doesn't apply to new construction, then new construction would have no incentive to do anything other than the least costly uh, method on the ground floor, which might not be to the liking of people who are walking along the sidewalk. Regardless. And, and Sorry, Diana, you're breaking up at least on my audio. Breaking up on all our audio. And I can. Maybe I can simplify it. If you if you just say that we're adequately covered for new construction on that point, uh, even if the zoning new zoning doesn't apply. That will sort of answer my question, and then we can go into the reasons for it when you get better audio. Sorry, uh, Diana, is that part covered in Appendix G? May May I just interject to respond to this, Jeff? Um, sure. So I, I don't believe that our resolution actually covers that section and the coastal resiliency text, it does get quite specific and there are a lot of conditions that um, are less than ideal. And if it does not apply to new construction, then I agree that that incentive to provide a better treatment for the pedestrian experience um, in flood proofed uh, ground floors will will basically just end up being whatever's the cheapest thing that they can do again because yeah so yes you are right in your read of the situation and the and the resolution doesn't specifically address that i do not believe okay. because that was not a part it was not a part of the zoning that we deemed unfavorable no no she's saying it right you didn't deem it unfavorable but you eliminate it to new construction, so it, that incentive won't be there. And so for new construction, you do have the risk of the cheapest and not necessarily um, pleasant uh, ground floor uh, construction being put in. Okay. In other words, the motivation was a financial incentive, but it was an incentive to do something that we might like to be done. 
and that by eliminating application to new construction and that incentive no longer exists. True, it kind of reminds me of the Water Street Tax Amendment, which was about incentivizing people to activate the ground level that they should have done already. But, okay. Uh, you know, I think Let's, it's a tough I, uh, yeah, I, almost I think, think that should be, if I could just, uh, I almost think that that should be a separate kind of treatment, which is that unesthetic, uh, human hostile ground floors should be something that, that, you know, we oppose <laughs> in some other way. Uh, we asked actually at the committee meeting about hospitals because they are not, um, they are not a part of this. They have different requirements and they have to be in the flood zone. They said that it wasn't, you know, that they have separate requirements for um, resiliency and FEMA stuff that they have to meet. So hospitals were not about this particular one. They're actually not included in the special use like a nursing home was. I think Tom actually said hostel, now. not hospital. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, yes. I said hostile. Yeah. Hostile. Um, I, Diana I a... just sent a note. Diana just sent a note saying her solution to solve the issue is to say in the resolution. That we would incur uh, Diana, you'd have to doesn't make sense to me what you wrote. I apologize. You'd have to come through, maybe try dialing in. Okay. I have, um, a, I have a question. Any can you, other? Can you hear me, uh, Tammy? Who is, is, ah, Jeff. Yes, I can. I've become, you got moved over. Good. I became a panelist, so I can speak now. Um, my question, yes. mine is a friendly amendment. I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm amazed by a 15 page resolution. Um, I think it's this, quite. This, this is shorter than that. This one's 10. Oh, I might be looking at the wrong one then. Where am I? Where am I? I I'm in the I zoning for coastal. The... No, nope. okay. zoning for coastal resiliency. Okay. Is your comment for I'm... this? Nope, I'm good. I can wait. Thanks. All right, gotcha. All right. So I, I don't find a solution in here unless you know. Can you Diana want to note send? That, you know. Diana, send it via email so we can read it and one of us could copy it into the chat. I mean, it seems like something that would be worth pursuing. Is that something you, you can don't? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh. Hi, Diana. Thanks. Thank you. I just had a, a recommendation that might help um, alleviate Jeff's issue. I, and I think the intent, I, I think the intent of the committee was to say that they don't want the incentives or the bonuses to apply to new buildings, would it solve Jeff's issue to say, um, instead of we don't want the proposed zoning text to only apply to, uh, uh, urges this proposed zoning text to only apply to existing buildings, not new buildings, would it solve Jeff's issue to specify that we want, um, we only want there to be incentives for existing buildings and not new buildings? Well, not quite, because the, the issue that I was raising is that one of the incentives that there is for the new buildings as well as for the old buildings is to do is for ground floor treatment that is pedestrian friendly and that absent the zoning right now there is no incentive for that uh, appendix g does not require that and, and indeed it can be satisfied based on their presentation by some pretty ugly developments uh, that would be cheaper to do uh, at the ground floor, uh, thereby effectively raising the retail level to the second floor, um, you know, with stairs and whatnot. Um, and uh, one of the things in the zoning text amendment is to incentivize build, you know, building owners, new, new and retrofitted, to have the ground floor treated uh, properly and the incentive for doing that is to give that extra floor. But there is no, see, I, I, I fear that this incentive 
discussion was focused on the incentives for retrofitting to comply to Appendix G. And people were pointing out, well, for new buildings, they already have to apply comply with Appendix G. Why do they need any incentives? And the partial answer to that is that they can apply, they can comply with Appendix G by doing things that are pretty ugly. In fact, that would be the cheapest way to do it, pretty ugly at the ground floor level. Uh, and the incentive is not for them to comply with Appendix G. They've got to do that anyway. The incentive is for them do, to do so in a pedestrian-friendly manner, and they get the bonus a, 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 as a result. And so, absent some sort of incentive or requirement for that matter, um, there's there's no reason to expect them to do that at the ground floor. I'd, I'd be okay if we left it as a required zoning, but not the intent of the committee was not for the incentive. I so if you want to, like if, if the, no, I'm not if sure. the conversation goes that way, then it would be to require them to adhere to the street level. But the whole point of the dialogue had a lot to do with for new development, not doing a financial incentive through zoning. Okay, I don't understand the. You law. don't like the, if you don't if you don't if you don't like the friendly amendment, you don't you know if you don't want to take it that way. I understand that, and that's okay. I, I'm not but sure what the friendly. We need to move on for a vote. Um, but uh, You're Tammy, I, I wasn't clear what the friendly amendment was. I I, I didn't think it had anything to do. What with Diana this. said. What Diana said was to require that the street level treatments are put into the perpetuity without the bonus for new development. So they're not getting the fiscal incentive. It's just a requirement. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Is that could you read the language again, Diana? Uh, I, I'm doing this on the fly, so I apologize that I don't have um, language in front of me, but I, I agree with, with Tammy's interpretation and for this clause that says um, that the CD urges that this proposed text apply only to existing buildings, not new buildings, to specify that that's um, regarding the incentives and the bonuses specifically, but that we still want the uh, the street roll requirements and such uh, to apply across the board. Okay. I mean, so they would, I mean, there, there are no street level requirements other than in the zoning incentive. So I guess you would be suggesting adding something either to the building code or adding something to There the are, Jeff, that's not true. There are, they, they did put in there about planting. They did put in there about tables and chairs. They did put different things about no, high leveling for street required. level. Those aren't required though. And I don't think we would have a regulation that would require people to planters. Those are things that if you do them, you get a benefit. Are we suggesting we wanna require planters and require windows on all ground floor? I, I don't think we would be- Part of the requirement. It's part of the requirement for new construction. That there be planters? I would like it for all. This is Jason Friedman, but I, it's part of the requirement. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a zoning expert and I feel like we're going into a zoning uh, hole here because it's because you're saying uh, it's a requirement. And even underlying in the district, there are requirements to develop properties, whether they be new developments or alterations to existing developments that exceed thresholds that are already set in the zoning resolution that require things like street tree planting or waivers for parking or parking. Um, so this is like a, just an, it's an add-on. And I think as part of the add-on, they already are making certain things that it sounds like you would want for maybe both types of buildings, new and altered as part of a requirement so to develop the property. I say okay. yes to what you just said, Jason. This is time for I'll, I'll take your exactly. word for it. It's so not, I think like a crazy zoning regulation, so but Jeff, I'll take your word for it. Jeff. <laughs> so do I hear a call for question? Question. Second. No, no, no. Oh, I was just okay. muted. I was, trying, I was trying to ask a question before you called the question. I was muted. Goodbye. 
Really? All right, fine. Vicky, uh, it's over. I, I, I apologize. Okay, I need to ask I a apologize. question. Let's, let's, I need to ask a question before I can vote because of the way it's worded. There's a question on the floor. You can't. I can't ask a question to clarify how I'm voting. That's ridiculous. Of course, I can. I need to know. I have already. I'm I asking a question to clarify what I'm asking to be voting on. I'm asking a question about the amendment. Okay, Jeff. Okay. Jeff, go ahead, and then I'm not sure if it's Lucy or Diana or Lucian who's go doing roll call tonight. Please, one of you be ready after we answer Jeff. My the way question. It's, the way it's worded to me is very. The therapy it resolved is very strange. The way it's worded to me that we're rec so we're 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 saying that we're against it unless unless. So if I'm Correct. voting yes, Unless what am I voting for? Unless you do the following thing. You're, so I'm voting if for. You're voting yes, I, you're, if you're voting yes, you're supporting an unfavorable unless they do those conditions. Okay. If they hand in all those conditions or they change and come back with a revised, then it's a win. So wouldn't, wouldn't they change all those conditions and come back to us before we voted on it again? I mean, I don't, and we vote on it again? It is, I mean, it is possible every community board is voting on this and this will be will go to borough board. They postponed the vote because there were yeah, many okay. people who hadn't opined yet and there was some positive and some negative. So it is not untold. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Uh, Lucian, I think your roll call tonight, right? Tammy, can you just clarify the That's amendment right. as Diana had um, put forth uh, on the third, therefore be it resolved? Is that being accepted or not into the text here? Because I think it's it's not a bad idea. I just wasn't sure where we stood on that. Did that get accepted or not? I I accepted it as Diana worded it. Jeff Galloway said he didn't want it, and uh, no, 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 if he doesn't want, want it, it, stop it and move on. No, I did not say I didn't want it. I, I just questioned the, the particular wording. I, I, I do want it. Many people are texting privately. We have spent 25 minutes with one board member. We are now at 9 o'clock on the first. Bruce, Bruce, gotcha. Can, can we vote Diana, on whether we put this amendment in? We here? are voting. Okay. Yes, we are voting because it reflects the view of the committee at the time. No okay, problem. Are we voting on this amendment, Tammy, or just the whole resolution? What is this vote? I'm is accepting it? the amendment as Diana put it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tammy, um, I'm ready to call roll. Just as a reminder to all the board members, when I call your name, please say your last name and uh, how you're voting. And then Lucy will enter it into the vote sheet. So thank you. Tammy, why don't you repeat for everybody again what a no and yes vote means, please. A yes, a yes vote means you are supporting the resolution, which is here are the things we don't agree with. If you don't do these things, we don't support it. It's just kind of the way that goes. Thank it's you. It's not a yes, we support the zoning. We do not support the zoning as written. But Listen, yes, so again, when I vote, first, right, when I vote, I'm going to say Meltzer votes yes. That's an example. Lucian, roll call. Here we go. Starting off at the top. Amoruso. Yes. Amoruso, yes. Burton. <laughs> Burton votes yes. Blank. Blank votes no. I mean, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Blank votes. I had the cat. <laughs> Terrible at poker. Uh, Brown Kennedy. Brown Kennedy, yes. Cameron. Cameron. Cameron, please repeat. I'm sorry. Cameron, yes. Thank you. Cassell. Chang. No. Rosa Chang, no. Correct. Okay. Chapman. Chapman, yes. Tracudian. Oh, yes. I'm going to ask. We have uh, uh, some background noise. Someone's getting some uh, text alerts, it sounds like. If everyone could mute until it's your turn. <clears throat> Darren, I heard Tracudian, yes. Chu. 
two. Cole. Cole votes yes. Thank you. Kucha. Abstains. Kucha abstains. Cunningham. Yes. Cunningham, yes. Curtis. Curtis, yes. Ehrman. Bruce, you may need to unmute yourself. Self and vote. Ehrman. Come back to him. Keep going. Flynn. Flynn, yes. It looks like Bruce has a little warning sign next to him. Oh, so yeah, we'll his connection stabilizes. Thank you. Friedman. Yes. Galloway. Galloway, yes. Goldstein. Goldstein, yes. Gupta. Gupta. Kathy Gupta. Okay, Jesse. James. James, yes. Thank you. Joyce. Joyce, yes. Kay. Kay, no. Canel. No, but yes. Kettering. Kettering, yes. Clementus. Abstain. Clementus abstain. Lamory. Lamory, yes. Lewinson. Lewinson, yes. Mahoney. Mahoney, yes. McHugh. McHugh. Meltzer. Meltzer votes yes. Nahowski. He has microphone issues. Uh, can you check and see if he's check if he's in the attendee list and not on a panel list? Because I can't find him myself. Okay. I'll, yep, I'll, he needs to be moved over. My hawk. Did, you, did you say my hawk? My hawk's yes. Thank you. I'm getting Dennis right now. Okay. Yep, he's over. Okay. Mahalski. Yes, Mahalski, yes. Thank, thank you. Bon Jovi. Moore. Yes. Notaro. Schneck. Star. Star, yes. Sung. Sung, yes. Tedesco. Townley. Wade. Weinstock. She's excused. Weinstock, yes. She. She, yes. Zelter. Zelter abstains. Herman. Mm. Gupta. All right, so we'll just wait for Bruce to come back on, but um, that's everyone. And Tammy, it looks like uh, the eyes have it. 30 in favor, two opposed, three abstain, zero recuse. Gotcha, thank you. All right, let's move on. We'll mark Bruce here, but not uh... Taylin is uh, not voting on the, in the panelist, so I'm going to move him over really quick. If you move him over, he can vote now. That's fine. I, I appreciate that. Taylin, apologies. You're in there. Let us know. What, what's your vote? Manjovi? Manjovi, yes. Okay. Thank you, Taylin. Taylin. Okay. Uh, Susan Cole and Quality of Life and Small Business Working Group are going to have a dialogue about how to respond to the mayoral executive order and city council intro 2127-2020. It is about outdoor dining and it is about 
uh, who controls the rules, regs, and how it works, especially in the waning days of a uh, mayoral uh, government. So that's postponed. Um, uh, organic versus Susan, go ahead. It's not going to be. Uh, 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 we met, and I'm. Uh, my committee will make a resolution for January. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, resolutions we can certainly talk about next month. Um, and then 250 water, the brownfield cleanup will, uh, Laura Dodge came, she will be coming back in January and the public testimony is up and running now. Okay, let's move on. Bruce just texted me, he's having uh, internet issues. So I'm gonna send him a dial-in number. All right, and let's take it off to Governor's Island. Can we get the resolution up? And hands up, please. I just want to take a second to remind everyone, I've been sending in the chat, but take a, take a look at the chat. Um, there's a link to all the resolutions, including Governor's Island, 250 Water Street. I'll post it back in the chat again so you can pull it up on your own computer screen if this is a little too small. Thank you. So I want to remind everyone we've had, I don't even hesitate to, we've had meetings September, October, November, December on this. Um, Fern has been gracious enough to chair those meetings and through a ton of hard work, a resolution was figured out. There's three pages for therefore be it resolved. We are not showing slides tonight. I hope that you have all had the chance to review any of the public information from the from the public hearing we had, the presentations, everything has been online, including the YouTube channel with all of the details from all the Q and A's. Uh, you heard tonight, um, Governor's Island came back to us with a letter that is also being shared in the link. Um, that was in response to the committee vote um, which Claire very much understood when we had this dialogue in terms of how the Euler process worked, that it was an unfavorable unless, and they have already uh, started to take efforts to see what can be done to address and um, the points that have been raised. There are a couple typos on here that I believe Diana fixed between uh, yesterday and today. Yes, Diana? That be a fair thing to say. Diana's having audio. Um, yes, that's correct. Turn. Okay, good. All right. Um, so let's do hands up for questions. This is one of the most important um, follow ups to remember and just understand that once it leaves community board one, it goes to the borough president's office um, and they will also have a public hearing. Okay, I'm looking for hands up. Jeff, I know you asked, uh, all right, we're gonna start with Jeff Myhawk because his hand was up first and then Colin and then Andrew. Mine's just a simple, can you hear me? Can you sure. hear me? Mine's just a simple procedural, yeah. uh, I guess you could call it a friendly amendment that in these in these kind of in these kind of uh, wordings of the final therefore be resolves that rather than saying that unless the following modifications are, I would say unless and until. And that and that I just for some reason for me that works better if I'm being a little strange about that. I apologize. I'm not I'm not trying to say we have to do that, but to me it seems more like unless and until these following modifications are met. Because I don't really see them making all these modifications down the line, and I wonder if we'll have to all, all the last one and this one will have to resubmit something to us to, for us to consider again. That's all. I'm just I think it's that because it's stronger. Thank you. Okay, uh, Justine, you you will thank you, Jeff. I heard. Let's let's hear from everybody before we go through with that. Colin, Andrew, Rosa, then Justine. 
I was actually hoping to use my time to call to question, but since so many people have questions, I guess I can't do that. But just really one fast I'll come back to you, Colin. And okay. one really fast point is the self sustainability uh, language isn't quite strong enough for what I was hoping for the other night in terms of renewable energy deployment. So I just hope someone could just address that. That's all. Self sustaining doesn't mean anything. Self sustaining in terms of self generating renewable energy means something completely different. That's all. So, are you making a friendly amendment that says you would like to see Governor's Island within the zoning, or do you want it in the RFP? That's really the the question. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm talking about the language that's in the existing resolution. It talks about I can't okay. see it here, but it talks now about they're writing like how how they are going to kill somebody that day, like in a movie script. Uh, Mariama, mute. Mariama. <laughs> Thank you, um, Colin. Sorry. Super easy point. It talks about self sustainability, but doesn't talk about that can yeah. mean financial, that can mean energy, that can mean anything. You just have to insert renewable energy, energy generation, or something like that in there. That's my only point. So environmental self sustainability doesn't work for you. It's fine. It's fine. What do, What do you want it to say, Colin? I for, I actually wrote the original language. I forgot what it was, but it needs to reflect self powered off grid self generation uh, self sustainability. That's all. It's not a big deal. Let's just move on. Well, you're asking, I mean, just add the words you're asking self powered. I mean, it was your point and if I yep. don't. I don't know that we're going to challenge specifying. I don't, I don't know. No, imagine. we're not. That's fine. I, I, Diana, can you change that for Colin, please? Thank yes, you. So we'll read um, self powered and off grid um, self environmental self sustainability. Yeah, Correct. The exact language. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank Colin. you, Colin. Accepted. Andrew Zelter, then Rosa, then Bruce. Thanks, Tammy. Um, I have a, a couple of clarifying questions on the resolution, but I, I was hoping to speak in the public session because I, I did want to share an experience that I think is very relevant to this conversation. And it had to do with my work on the Pier 40 task force as a, a appointee for CB1. And this is virtually an identical situation that we're facing where we have an, a trust that is seeking to amend its governing legislation or, or, or act to permit commercial development that will generate a revenue stream that is meant to enable continued build out or complete the build out of the park and manage ongoing maintenance. And I can tell you in the case of Hudson River Park and Pier 40, we had the exact same issues come up. Concern of privatizing parks, this being a Trojan horse for developers, the lunacy of public funding versus the need to be self-sufficient and the risk of final design being inconsistent with the initial goals and objectives. And I can tell you that the, the entire issue of Hudson River Park and Pier 40 has been ongoing for 40 plus years, sorry, 15 plus years. And what remains today is the status quo, which is a, a dilapidated building that obstructs views and truly prevents that pier from becoming a more functional asset and resource for the community. And I think we're, we're potentially with this resolution, which imposes conditions that really doesn't allow a path forward from a financial sustainability perspective. It feels like we're repeating that history. And I just want everyone to be aware. Again, we spent 15 years with elected officials, local community boards and others trying to find alternative solutions for the funding need and it has never come forward. And we are now at the table for truly the fifth time addressing the exact same issue of amending the act to allow for commercial. So I just think we should keep that backdrop in mind as we think about this. In terms of the resolution itself. Andrew, Andrew you, you muted yourself. Sorry. One, the, the, Andrew, Andrew, by the way, this does not say no development. It definitely says development is still in the mix. So it, it is different. It, it, and it's, it is different because it's city zoning. 
it's not state. It, it, there are there are contextual differences of how things apply in city zoning. So I, I hear where you're going, and we are want to be careful not to paralyze them. I understand that point very clearly. Keep and going. I, and I understand that distinction. I, I do think this potentially paralyzes at least for the time being. But anyway, that's subject to a vote. In terms of the resolution itself, um, the last whereas on page two, where it starts with the project area is comprised of the entirety of Governor's Island. I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. that's if that's confusing to suggest that this proposed rezoning is impacting all of the 172 acres versus the 33 acres that it's it's uh, brought forward or put forward. So I don't know if there's a way to clarify that. It just seems confusing uh, if you're not really in the weeds on this. The, can I respond to two points here, Tammy? Um, first of all, the whole island is being, it, the zoning does affect the entire island. So that's in fact a, a factual statement that's true. And I just want to go back to your earlier point, which I much appreciate. You, like I, Andrew, very much followed Pier 40 and the HRPT legislation. This is not legislation, it's a zoning uh, proposal. That was, a, I think, seven, um, more or less a 700,000 square foot building on a pier. This is a 172 acre island. Um, and looking to rezone itself, uh, you know, this is these, I would say they're not really comparable. I appreciate your point about, well, you don't want to find yourself with nothing on the island that, and, and the park goes away because somehow or other we're not, uh, you know, going to support this. But I, I just think they're very, very different. And, um, you know, I, I just want to make that point. This is a rezoning. This isn't legislative. It's not a 700,000 square foot building. Um, and that was, a, you know, just a couple of key points anyway. Yeah, to, to, me, it's a, to me, it's a question of being able to do on Pier 26 or what was done on Pier 26 on Governor's Island. And if they need money to do that, that's what this proposed rezoning is addressing. And Not comparable. This is zoning for an entire island. I, I, I would I would argue with that. I, mean, I beg to. I, I, uh, I'm okay. not going to agree let's, with that. Let's, both of you have made your points. Let's move on. Andrew, what else do you have? So that was my first uh, point. First, where I, whereas on page six, again, the way I'm reading it is that essentially, should this proposal proceed, the community benefit is six acres of new public accessible open space. And, and while that might be very specific to the implication is that's the extent of the community benefit. And I think that's misleading. I think there are far reaching community benefits that re potentially result from this that, that aren't referenced here. Where does this it... is specifically about the land. Where you're talking about density floor area height and bulk, you're not talking about community benefits. It's, it's about that category. Is that what you're talking about? What, what I'm talking about is what is implied in that where. Essentially, for lack of better phrasing, in exchange for for this project moving forward, the, the community benefits from a, the addition of approximately six acres of new publicly open space. That 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 may be that is true. true. That it, it, yes, it's true, it is it a true statement. I get that, but what I'm saying is, it's narrow in its focus and suggests someone someone reading this might say. That's the community give back. That's all that's involved here is six acres of newly publicly accessible space. There's no reference to not if not not if they're reading the whole thing. So, I mean, you're taking one out of context. If they're reading the whole thing, that it's clear that that's not that. I appreciate what you're saying, but it's in part of an overall section. Well, I think I think what's missing from this resolution is reference to the potential community benefit from here or, or from this or as a result of this. And that is the continued build out and ongoing maintenance of a community asset that's just invaluable to us. And I don't know how to incorporate that. I'm happy to propose language while we're do discussing this, but as I read that, that just seemed to be a, a oversight as as part of the, the that, communication and messaging. I understand this is this is a zoning application. Right, and this is about additional public space. That's the only additional public space that is coming out of the zoning. 
the benefits and other community benefits will be addressed in the RFP process, depending on what has already been said. This is about a zoning application. So I hear where you're going. There are other benefits and they are noted elsewhere in the resolution. Okay. Yeah, again, Tammy, I, yeah. I understand the distinction to- I, he I hear them, what you're saying. But, but it's hard to decouple them. I just think it's hard to focus solely on this as a zoning issue without understanding what's driving it. And this doesn't highlight what's driving it. But anyway, understand, again. but look at look at the section that it's in, Andrew. It's in proposed use and open space regulation. So it's directly tied to that topic. Right? It's about the open space. It's not about the other benefits or anything else that comes. It's specifically targeting that. It's a narrow focus because that is the topic heading that it's under the open space regulations. So I hear where you're going, but we're not, you're not mixing in, in that section. If you want something anywhere else to be said about, you know, community benefits, we can certainly take a look and see where that might fit. But we, you know, we don't need to note that because this is about the zoning and the open space and the community benefits that were given, right? Okay. I hear where so, you're going. Yeah, so I'm like I, I, I'm I don't think I don't I don't think it goes there. I mean, and one of the things we did talk about in public engagement, you know, and other things was, you know, this is zoning, right? Zoning, zoning. Right, it's zoning for a specific objective, but I, I understand what you're saying, and I have a, a thought where is where to possibly incorporate language, and if you're okay, I'll send that to. Uh, send it to the host. Right, and he can put it in. All right, let's go to the next. If you're okay, can I move on to the next person? Did you get all of your points? So my, my, my last point, and again, I, I reference this because it just was an, a never ending discussion that occurred on uh, Pier 40. The trust presented financials, the community board represented the financials weren't sufficient. It just continued to go back and forth until the community board presented very specific asks rather than a generic ask of a pro forma. So as we've already seen, the trust is represented, they presented financials, we're making a statement that they refuse to, I think we need to, to clarify Andrew, this. We asked, we asked for those financials that would allow us to understand in Q1 of 2020. When they came back in September, it was not there. We asked again and again. So it is fair statement in the financials. It would be one thing if we only asked once, but it was asked by leadership in January when they came to us. It was asked in September, and it was specifically asked to understand how the 2013 versus 2020 related and to understand the scope and sliding scale as listed in here. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have. And what we would like to do, and I think Diana correct there that they did they did make a financial presentation on november 19th so i, I think that that is on there because we did update that to reflect that sorry it's where it should be there diana did you have a yeah I'm, I'm looking for it and that is a a, a clarification that i put in um, to, to include more of what the trust did provide uh, by way of financial considerations. Here it is. Correct. Um, that uh, the trust presented financial projections. Um, it's in this one here at the November 9th meeting. And um, it, below Perfect. this is an addition here that um, references the trust's response on the minimum development, which they had stated uh, a five, 500,000 square foot reduction. Uh, is there is there minimum uh, level of development needed to achieve financial self sustainability? All right, so I'm going by hand raises. Andrew, I think we can come back to you if you have anything else beyond this, because I want to give other people a chance and it's 923. That's fine. Right. Thanks, Tammy. I'm going to. 
No worries. Um, I was going to go Rosa, Bruce, Tricia, Justine. Those are hands that are up. Jeff Myhawk, you've already spoken. If your hand stays up by the time I get to Justine, then I know you want to talk again. Rosa? Thank you. Um, I have three friendly amendment proposals. Um, the first one is related to the East Promenade. Given that the East Promenade is currently planned to be 55 feet wide from the water's edge to the private development line, um, and mm -hmm. that it is expected to safely incorporate within that 55 feet the passage of 150 to 300 vehicles, uh, pedestrians that usually travel in groups, um, some sort of a passive recreation space for enjoyment by the water's edge where you're not gonna get run over by a passing vehicle, um, fencing of some sort to separate you from the water's edge, uh, a buffer between the road and, um, or sidewalk and the new building's edge and bicycles and bike carts and go carts and all of those other things. Um, I feel like 55 feet is just way too narrow. And just so people are aware in the new proposal, um, the development proposal, the primary connections are stated to be a minimum of 60 feet. So if primary connections, which in their renderings do not even um, seem to allow for bicycles, cars, or any of that, and it's a pedestrian walkway, if only pedestrians need 60 feet, then I do not understand why all of that other stuff that I just mentioned um, is expected to fit within 55 feet. Um, so I think it's unclear as to if it is. So are you asking for a widening of the east at? I don't want to advocate for fences. I apologize. I mean, I, I can understand. Would you be comfortable with? asking for review of the size of the East Promenade to handle competitive uses and look at mechanisms to provide safe safety. Yes, I don't want to I don't want to recommend yes. I don't I don't yes. want to recommend fences. I don't want to tie their hands. I want them to figure that out. We can keep it very loose, but definitely they need to study the safe simultaneous use of multi <laughs> multi forms of movement within this space especially given that they are also requesting 150 cars and also um one other thing i didn't mention is that with the coastal hold resiliency on, wait. hold on hold on rosa yeah. diana do you have that clear enough to add as a friendly amendment do yeah thank you also, rosa just next be aware that the um it also includes possibly split level issues with um, the getting from, I guess, sidewalk level to new building base level, which is something else. Second uh, friendly amendment is uh, carving back lot E4 to um, allow Picnic Point to properly terminate as the southern tip, southernmost tip of the island for public use, not I don't, private use. I don't, I'm going to... I'm going to rely on Diana and Alice, but I believe, I don't know if that ship has sailed. I think we can put it in as a whereas that we have, you know, that that's something that we would like and we are looking for, but I don't know because the development zones were approved. I don't know. I don't think we can chip away at those is what I, I'm saying. I don't think, if I'm understanding you, Rosa, what you're asking for, and I remember it coming up, you had mentioned it in an earlier meeting, is that, the I mean, the development stone could stay, it would just, it, you're asking that no building be built on that part of the development zone. Is that a, another way to interpret what you're asking for? So that, sort what, of. So currently I'm, where right. lot E4 is shown actually eats into what is currently Picnic Point, first of all. Right. So Picnic Point, as it stands today, is would part of it would be eaten away by lot E4. Um, secondly, yes, if the, if they want to call it part of lot E4, but the building does not uh, build on the southernmost tip portion so that the public still retains access to that tip, I think that that would be sufficient for me. Yes. So that would answer to Tammy's point that 
you know, the shift sailing in terms of that not going to be changed out of a development proposal, but that rather you're asking that nothing that no building be developed and, and maybe open space, a great space, a continuation of picnic point it would be developed there. And I'm not talking about all of E4, I'm just talking about enough to terminate picnic point properly. I, E4 is huge. I, I hear that, but I, you know what, you and I think that E4 is, is huge. I don't think, I don't think we can use it as a condition on less. Because what if, what if the developer who takes that lot decides that they want to expand and do whatever it is that's public space there for whatever that meshes with picnic point, but isn't exactly picnic point. Right, or maybe that in the development zone, they do a water feature. And if you limit that. I mean, we can put in the, I think it would be good to put in a whereas that our preference. In the RFP is for that lot is that they find a contextual way to end picnic point in a more gracious manner, something like that. Well, it's an interesting point. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's an interesting point that Rose is raising because it's kind of in keeping with the um, points made in terms of lowering density, you wonder if that is a way to potentially lower density that could be written into the zoning. So I don't know that it, I'm not sure where it belongs, but I think it's a, a very worthwhile point because in the call for the community asking for lower density, you're going to have to find how that but, gets done. But and then are you specifically tailoring, Alice, are you then specifically tailoring how that lot will be used? Well, you may be calling that that lot be redrawn. That's, I mean, you're going back to saying it's, that's a federal complaint, but I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm just saying it's a, it's not an, it's not an insignificant point that Rose has raised. That's all. And I think it's, should be Rosa, recognized. if you can find, Rosa, if you can find a way to word it, that does not make it, um, if you can find a way to friendly word it, like with Andrew, where we changed and added the financial, then let me know. Okay, Perhaps think about it. Could it could be used, used as and simply as an example, you know, as an example for uh, Diana. Hold on, Alice, Diana. Um, oh, Diana. I, I think maybe a broader and a, and I th I don't think it behooves us to to try to be too prescriptive given all the parameters. Um, I want to throw in that the applicant has said that um, there's actually uh, actually there will actually be additional open space built where the fence currently is. And that it does not eat into picnic point. Either way, I, I think we could simply say that the community board wants to see that space left open or wants to prioritize open space there, doesn't want to see a building there, etc. I would I would be okay with that. I I never okay. got to take the I would in the resolution class, so I'm hesitant for the wording. <laughs> We're gonna don't don't worry. We're gonna get it going for the Q1. Okay. okay. And then, Bruce, and then Trisha. The last one. Um, so regarding heights, I know that we, uh, reading the resolution text, I know that there was some, we danced around the height issue, but never really pegged anything. And I think that it is correct. Even if we do not have a specific height that we are working towards, and we do not have a specific base that has been agreed upon and set, what I would recommend is that we peg the height to a known and existing, um, structure so either you you peg it to the statue of liberty which you've you know already referenced within the text or you peg it to the battery maritime tunnel vent or Liggett hall right so you say you know based off of that element then you got either move up or down the problem rosa we heard that but the problem was there was an agreement at committee we had no agreement on what that was and that was the problem that we came to with the resolution there wasn't a solid agreement on what the height should be. Some people said less than the, you know, less than the Statue of Liberty in its entirety, including setbacks. Other people said 300 feet, a 30 story building is still too big. Some people said like at Terrace, some people, as people remember, there were two people on the call who said zero development. So 
um, and voted against it because they didn't want to see any development of any kind on the island. Not that they weren't against what they just didn't want anything so because we couldn't find a middle ground. We didn't spec a specific building height. I don't I'm know that we'd be ready to do that tonight. I'm not saying spec a specific building height. I'm just saying that going forward, we say that it will be re the reference height will be the reference point to establish the maximum height would be off of an existing building. So that then whether the base plane goes up or down, whether coastal resiliency happens or not, um, you know, just say inclusive of all permitted obstructions, the reference point for establishing the maximum building height will be, you know, X. Call it the top of we the don't have a green we don't have agreement for that, so we can certainly attempt to do that here, but we didn't have agreement for that in the meeting. And I'm, it's been such a, a big contentious thing. So I'm, I'm not sure I'll, I'll let me hear from others and see what they say on that. Can, can I ask a question? But, you know, the two, yeah, sorry. Alice, wait, yeah, I was going to ask Rosa something. Let's, let's, okay, go ahead. Because we have the reference points already that we've said as both Liggett Hall, the air vent and the Statue of Liberty, they're in there, but we didn't prescribe which one because we didn't have agreement. So let's hear from others and see where we go. Tricia. Hi, sorry. Hi, Tricia. I spoke to someone before me. Um, <clears throat> so I, I want to just give another like. What Andrew said um, was what I wanted to share a little bit of too. I think I'm very respectful of this process. Um, <clears throat> and if people don't think it's time for us to be talking about um, what Andrew suggested as well as this height issue, then I'll go with the majority. But I, from you know my PTSD on things like this, I think it's worth mentioning. I, I think that there's something about planting the expectations if we're going to give them a window, a door out, you know, if we're going to talk about only if you at all, that to me, it makes sense to go all the way and get a little bit more specific. Um, it's not that we couldn't change it later, but I think it's good to have them thinking along these lines, that accountability, you know, it's really hard to get back later. And so, I don't know for what it's worth the and I feel the same way about um, the seaport really is that height really, especially in places of recreation and across the streets from schools really changes the experience. This is a recreational island. We have to talk about the Harbor School, you know, I mean, the, they are the founding, you know, 1 of the founding residents. Um, and so I think there should be the expectation that we. You know, maintain that light that there that we should, you know, if we even consider this development and that we consider, you know, long awaited um, and they're not amenities. They're really what makes the school whole. And I think that it's important for people to understand that they're there and to understand they're part of something that already exists. So that's my 2 cents. Oh. Rosa and Trisha, so I now hear two for a height limit. One was not agreed on in committee. If you have one, then, you know, think it through and speak up. Uh, who was after Trisha? I think. Justine. I think and Bruce. I think I'll hold on. Thanks. Now I'll be really quick. Okay, just, you're you can hear me or no. Yes. Okay, um, I, I think that. The other thing that I really wanted to say was I, I like on page 11 and 15 where it mentions the Harbor School and the expansion and including the new pool and it references the Youth and Education Committee December 2020 resolution. Why isn't that referenced in the um, therefore be it resolved? So it's like, I, I, and maybe. Because it's not about zoning. Okay, I was wondering if you're going to say that's so the only thing you can therefore be it resolved is zoning and the rest of it. But I also then would put my 2 cents in for the for the height requirement that Trisha and. 
somebody else was talking about and I now forgot. Okay. I, what's and, your height? All right. I don't know. I don't, I don't you know. You know my next answer, answer is going to be what's the height limit? How high. Yeah, I know. Tammy, can I chime in on this point just as an offer? Because yeah. I think where Rosa was going was a good idea, which, or, if, you know, I can see where people are going to want, maybe want a cap if, if it, rather than us defining this, of course, we couldn't probably do that very successfully tonight, but maybe the, the idea of the reference point, which I think gets alluded to in the resolution, which is the Liggett Hall and tunnel buildings, um, the, the um, vent, uh, are, are, as, as the reference points, they're on the island, they're the tallest buildings on the island, they're both landmarked, if I'm not mistaken, they're both McKim Mead and White buildings that have you know, a real presence and maybe that's the reference, whether it goes up 1000 feet from there or goes down to 100 feet from there. It's a reference point and maybe that in and of itself would allow us so that when we're talking about scale, we have, we are referencing the, those, that, those particular heights. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a way maybe to. You know, not Alice, specify something, but Alice, it's Vicky. I think, um, I think the highest building there is 125 feet. It's that magic number 125. And that's nothing should exceed that. Okay, so Bruce goes, then Laura goes, and then Jeff Myha. Jeff, did you talk already? All right, Bruce. I did, I Laura. did, but I, I did, but I want to talk again for one second. Okay, after Bruce and Laura. Bruce, if you're not unmuting yourself, Laura, you're next. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I can, Bruce. Thank you. All right. uh, housekeeping, you get my it's vote. Okay. Right there, you got my vote. Secondly, I have to ask is landmarks next? Uh, I don't have the agenda here. Are we next? Bruce, stick to this. Let's get through this. I really just do you have a comment on Governor's Island? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, first of all, um, I've been involved with with Governor's Island since the beginning, and I'm on the board of LMCC. I just want to pose that in the case of uh, Battery Park City and in the case of Brooklyn Bridge Park, there was no financing mechanism. Those two parks right now are sustained and maintained because of the structure that was imposed upon them. There is no Fiorella LaGuardia. We're not getting government funds for it. I don't believe in massive development, nor should uh, Governor's Island be massively developed. I have opposed prior, you know, prior proposals, but if we're going to be um, uh, granular and particular here, and this resolution is brilliant, I, I don't know how you wrote it, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, then we have to understand a mechanism, a real mechanism, not just not just wordplay, to fund the island. How do we fund the island? The mechanism is on there, Bruce. It's through development, is what they were saying. Okay. As one of the sources with taxes, with this, with that. Okay, Laura, you're next. Well. I just wanted to put in a pitch for Liggett Hall being the benchmark for the height, having spoken with people um, from the National Park Service who are also, um, you know, have been concerned about the impact of tall buildings on their properties on the island and also the Statue of Liberty. And that had been the benchmark, uh, I was told. And so I would like to keep it as the benchmark. Okay, thank you, Laura. That was succinct. My gosh, highly appreciated. Okay, next, okay. next. Justine. Still ready. Okay, Justine. Okay, great. Uh, Alice, and then Jeff. I don't have anything to add. Sorry, I should take my hand down. Jeff Myhawk. Mine is a very simple question for a very long resolution. Is what we're, if they do the things we're saying they need to do to make us say yes, can they still build a hotel out there? Yes. Okay. So I'm a no on that vote. All right. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so Rosa, I'm coming back to you. Oops, Tom Burton. Tom, unmute yourself. Hi. There you go. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I sail around the harbor all the time, and uh, I'm 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 on water more than land out there mostly. And I would say that uh, the height restriction should be much le much less than the Statue of Liberty. That should be you know our not just our governing height, but it should be half of that. It should be the maximum. So I, I would think that you should never go above half that because it will start to really interfere and you have so much question and so much crowding. Um, and to add Governor's Island to the congestion uh, would 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 invade what really the, the the openness that you feel when you're out there, you really feel like you escaped and you got away. And if you start seeing tall buildings in your, you know, right out where you're trying to sail, you're going to block wind. We can't sail up the Hudson anymore because of the New Jersey waterfront, the prevailing winds are just blocked. It just sucks. You have to go down to the lower Harbor. If you start having the kind of wind conditions that you're going to get from tall, you know, tall buildings are going to start to change things. And it's just, it's just awful. And I think that it should be resisted at every, every possible moment, you know, that a, a tall building in the middle of the Harbor just is ridiculous. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So every, uh, can Jeff, I, sorry. this is coming back to you. Can I just say one quick thing? Uh, I asked my question quickly. I know everyone's worried about time. I just want to second what Tom was just saying. And I want people to imagine buildings as tall as the Statue of Liberty at the governor's island as they vote for this or don't vote for this. I would certainly, be, I would implore us to not vote for this resolution. Thank you. Well, Jeff, the question now goes back to Rose after we've heard from a large number of people. Rosa, there was a question on clarity that you wanted to make a friendly amendment for height. Is your friendly amendment after hearing from more board members that height is limited to the 125 foot or the top of Liggett Hall? Or is your amendment to say the preferences for at Hall, but allowable increases to including setbacks and the height of I would recommend that any new developments would use the height of Liggett Hall at 125 feet as a reference or datum point. I would not feel comfortable personally limiting the heights of the building right now because I do not have enough information, specific financial modeling, to be able to presume to make that decision. Okay, so that's going to go to the full board. So there's two votes. I'm going to call a question on her friendly amendment. So we're going to take a vote on the friendly amendment. Yeah, I second the friendly amendment. Is there not? Tammy, Tammy, you need to confirm with someone that I, I, I didn't was not able to do this that Liggett Hall is in fact 125 feet. I was able to confirm um, the vent is 126 feet, but I don't know. I read somewhere it was 80 feet. So I think we better just make sure that height, um, whatever the top of the cupola we're talking about, not the top of the building, which is only, I think, five stories or four stories, is just want to make that point so we can get part. Yeah. You know. Can I also add that I, 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 I believe Liggett Hall is relatively central uh, inland, uh, you know, in the island, and it's very different to have something out on the edge that's tall than in the center in the middle where there's a lot of, you know, and, and if it's just a couple and not the full mass of the building. So I, okay. I think we should limit it to, gotcha. you know. Gotcha. Stories. Bruce, put yourself on mute, please. Somebody mute I'm Bruce. Yeah, okay. mute me for the moment. I'm far from the computer. I can tell. And Lucian. Okay. And to clarify, Taking a look, Rosa, by the way, for E4, the footprint is actually smaller than what's fenced off and does not actually infringe on Picnic Point. There is more open space that will be built to extend Picnic Point. All right. 
uh, that came, the trust has sent me a note. So now there's a motion before us to, there's a motion before us that we have to vote on. And this is, this is about the friendly amendment to limit the height to Liggett Hall. Wait, what? Sorry, my Lucian, friendly you... amendment is only to set a datum point. It is not to limit the height. Oh, no, I want to. Uh, okay. Otherwise, this is a waste. Come on. This is how architecture works. You put a height limit. Yeah. But how do you know what that height should be? 125. Yeah, we did. 125. And they have to make it work like everyone oh, Vicky. else. What? It's 125. That I is hear what highest. That's why I this is. That. I think that's arbitrary. You know, it's not arbitrary. That's what the highest structure is on the island. I, I thought Rosa made it, so it's whatever her motion is, guys. Yeah. I, I Rosa, point, explain I, for the board what you're saying. Rosa, explain to the board what you mean by having it as a factum versus a height limit, please. Okay, the difference is that I am saying that there has been a lot of ambiguity as to how we are e able to even establish what the height is um, because the base plane is not set because there are no streets there from which to set the base plane because of coastal resiliency text, which we have just reviewed tonight and the a possibility of expanding upwards based off of that, whether it be by 10 feet or whether it be by 10%, um, there's some flexibility in that. And therefore, right. since we have previously referenced oh, the of Liberty and we have previously referenced Liggett Hall and the tunnel vent, what I'm saying is that if we work off of a, you know, call it a benchmark, a datum point, a reference point, whatever you want to call it, we're saying this is the point from which we're saying you go up or you go down. But we say everything, all inclusive height, including permitted obstructions, have to be within that height. But based off of those reference points, rather than some random as yet undetermined base plane, which is a concern that we have, that they could basically build up the bottom, right? That they could build up yes. the plane. And then that sets that, that's a very arbitrary, completely unknowable at this point, ground point to then, you know, from which they will build up. So we're saying they can't build up continuously and then start use that as their base plane, whatever the base plane is, and then go higher. We're saying, okay, we're working off of this reference point. And if we are able to determine at some point what the height should be, and I do not know what that is right now, then that's what they work off of. It's basically just, it's a reference point. It's not a height limit, it's a reference point. That is all. Can I, 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 just I wanna, actually, uh, can I just point out, I just, I did a quick little bit of research and uh, just for the note, just for the record, Liggett Hall is coming in at four and a half stories and a hundred. I don't think that includes the cupola. It, it doesn't include the cupola, a cupola. And there's no way that, that, I mean, I live in a building that's a hundred feet tall and I've been on governor's Island infinite number of times. And I've been near that building, which towers over everything out there. And that building is nowhere near 125 feet tall. I don't know okay, what so means, also I don't know what it means to have a datum point is when we're talking about a build a building that kind of defines that area as that tall. If you start having a number of buildings that tall on that island, you're really just changing the entire nature of that island. Again, I'd implore uh, my fellow board members to vote against this resolution. Okay. Um, so Rosie, you're not talking about a height limit of Liggett Hall, you're talking about a reference plane for using Liggett Hall as a reference plane. Correct. For for the base plane. Yes. Or for the, for the I eventual can... maximum building height. Yes. Yeah. So that if it's it ample, you... it, it leaves it open ended in that we are not saying you can only go to 120 or you can only go to 60. We're not saying that. I don't think that we frankly have enough information to be able to say that at but... this point. I can tell you that the top of the cupola is 100% 125 feet. Okay, there. As the government, as the trust has reported. Okay. Then, okay. Then let's go with that. Okay, so can um, I have my hand up? Go okay. ahead, Vicky. Sorry. All right. So, as an architect, 
We don't set a datum. When we do datums and where how we calculate streets and sidewalks, there are rules, we follow them. That is not the issue. The way you do it in my business is you set a height limit. And what we say is that not, nothing should exceed a height the highest height limit, for example, which would be the top of the cupola. And that's how it's done. So we cannot like opine on, on something that, that is already established in a profession. It's 125. Uh, and that's why you have that same dimension in, uh, 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 you know, here at, at, at 250 Water Street, right? That is okay. a fixed number. Well, all right. Okay, Mariama is next. She hasn't spoken yet on this topic, and then we're going to move forward for a vote. Clarification: I just wanted to know what right. the ramifications of voting no on this are. Okay, so first we're going to vote on the amendment. One, uh, you know, the trust has already come back in the letter and said they're going to work with work with us on the base plane. Rosa is suggesting that we accept uh, Lickett Hall as the reference for base plane. I think that's an easy, no one's gonna argue with that. I think that's fine, we can accept that. The question that we have to vote first is whether we want to put in here that the height maximum is 125 feet to the top of the cupola. And that's what we want from the entire island. That is the friendly amendment that was made by Vicky and others. And so that's what we need to vote on first. If that's a if that's a restriction that you want to put in, okay. So is it let's possible to vote on? Is it is it possible to uh, ask for a competing friendly amendment? <laughs> we don't. Uh, I'll put it to you this way: we don't have a height limit in here. We've said that three hundred was too much, and noted that the you know that what's existing is too much that we don't want it and we left the flexibility somewhere between Liggett Hall and, you know, 305 feet, including all obstructions, which would knock it down to or into the 200s. Okay, that's what's currently on the resolution. But whether the if friendly amendment passes or not, whether the friendly amendment passes or friendly not, amendment what are the ramifications passes. of voting the resolution down, if any? Our ramifications, because if you say no, right, we have to vote on something. If the motion doesn't pass, then CB1 is not opined. It's like, as we have. May, I, may I, it's very simple. It's like yes. liquor licenses. If you don't put in stipulation, and even if you vote no, you have to at least state what you would accept. So if you vote no, they can do whatever the hell they want. We lose our voice. Okay, Correct. I just wanted to clip, be, be clear Correct. on that. I wasn't sure. Thank you. So one twenty. Thank you, Mariama. I'm I'm not sure. So of the yeah. procedure. So so right now we're voting. We I accepted by friendly amendment for the base plan to be based off of Liggett Hall. That's fine. This is the friendly amendment that we're voting on is whether or not to limit development to 125 feet or which is the same as the Coppola from Liggett Hall. Yes, I said, can, can, can you run I, the vote? I, I, well, wait, 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 no one's called the question for the vote. Has anyone called a question for this vote? Damn, I'll call the question. I did. I'll second it. For that. What, when did that happen? So was just a second ago, someone was clarifying what the vote's about, and now we're called a question? Correct. That was done afterwards. I clarified what the vote was about. The question was called and seconded. So this is, I accepted one friendly amendment from Rosa about the base plane and the reference point. This is about the height of Liggett Hall. So for this, what? it is an amendment to restrict development to the height of Liggett Hall. Yes. Yeah. So, so go above I, the top of the so, cupola. So it's too late. It's too late to call. It's it's too late to make to make the motion to table this. Am I correct? You can't table it, Jeff. They're I'm going at, through the Euler process. You either well, say something or you uh, don't. And yes, it's too late. Well, I'm surprised what? that our, our board. I'm just going to say that I'm surprised our board ever brought this forward without considering the idea of putting hotels on Governor's Island. So <laughs> it's pretty distressing to me. Question has been called for second. Come exactly. Please stand no. by for Let's move. a vote. <clears throat> Tammy, I'm going to do this vote by um, asking if there is opposition 
abstentions or refusals and then just write it to everyone else as in favor, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Do I hear any opposition? Please say your name and say opposed. Yes, my hawk opposed. Thank you. Tom opposes the amendment. I'm Tom sorry. Burton opposes the amendment and would move to have it the bottom of the cupola. <laughs> of I would agree with Tom Burton's. Justine Kucha. I'm sorry, Lucian. Everyone... You can't do that? Okay, then I oppose the amendment. Stop. Everyone's talking about Justine, that is not a good thing to do. Tammy, listen to the professionals here. We're, go we're voting. Tammy, you need to stop it. Everyone, I'm muting everyone. Uh, we're going to start you, this vote over. Lucy is going to listen to what you say and enter the vote in. I'm going to call it. Um, so just please unmute yourself, say your name in opposition, and we'll and I'll say next uh, when Lucy puts it in. Okay, okay. So please, those in opposition. Lucian Zelter is opposed to the friendly amendment imposing a height restriction. Thank you. One moment. Okay. So Next, opposed please. to the height restriction. Rosa Chang opposed, opposed to the amendment. Opposes. Okay, one moment. <coughs> That's Goldstein. Thank you. Calloway opposes the amendment. Calloway. Opposed. Opposed. Yes. Somebody spoke in between that. Zelter and Goldstein, and I didn't really get your name, so you're going to have to say it again. Next person. Kettering opposes the amendment. Kettering opposes the amendment. Thank you. Next. Comentus opposes the amendment. Comentus opposes the amendment. Schneck opposes the amendment. Schneck opposes the amendment. Did you get Galloway? I think you did. Um, we did. Thank you. Guccia opposes the amendment. Guccia opposes the amendment. K opposes the amendment. K opposes the amendment. Flynn opposes. Flynn opposes the amendment. Okay, any abstentions? Meltzer abstains. Meltzer abstains. Chapman, abstains. Chapman abstains. Slow down, hold on. We have Ehrman abstains. Chapman abstains. Stains. Brown Kennedy abstains. Chairman abstains. Brown Kennedy abstains. My hawk abstains. My hawk abstains. All right. Hearing no more abstentions. Any recusals? This is Canell because I'm a member of the board of the trust for government. I recuse. Canell recuses. Any other recusals? Uh, yes, uh, it's Alice Blank. I have to recuse. I've been nominated um, to be on the trust board. Okay, Alice Blank, recuse. Okay, um, and then I'm sorry, Tom Thomas Burton. You said something the first round. Did did you make a an opposition abstention or recusal vote? I think he made a counter friendly amendment saying he wanted it to go to the bottom of the cupola. Justine, let him speak for himself. Do not speak for him, please. Thank you. Is he still Tom Burton, still? please unmute yourself. Okay, well. If Tom doesn't make I, that, I, I, that motion for himself, I'd like to make that motion. To, to make the uh, motion. Okay, just so say I'm going to take that off because he didn't, I can't get him to say it affirmatively. Okay. So that's fine, uh, but can I make that motion? I can't now. Um, well, oh, hello. Not the vote is desperately complete. on myself. So hello, second. I was trying desperately yes, to unmute myself. Yes, 
Uh, Burton, I am opposed and would move to replace it with a friendly amendment limiting it to the top of the A frame, bottom of the cupola. I would second that. Amendment. I would second that friendly amendment if I have the power to do that. Seven. Okay. Well, it looks like th there are 38 members present and there are 16, 7, 18 votes in the negative, which means that the um, friendly amendment passes. Tammy, back to you. 18 negative, 18 negative and abstent. Does that include abstentions? Yeah, abstentions and recusals count against the vote. So that's 18. It includes. Uh, opposite. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, she, uh, Lucy's putting the in favors in now. Yeah, so 18 includes 11 opposed. 5 abstention to recusals. We don't need a roll call that when it's that close to make sure we got it right. No, how many, how many affirmative votes? 20. I think that it's 20, it's 20 to 18. So I think that the best way to do this, it passes. Um, so it passes. All right, so we are now going to full vote on the resolution. Hey, Tammy. And the full vote on the resolution. Yes, Andrew. Sorry, I know it feels like we've beaten this to death, but there were two, it seemed like there were two components to what the trust brought forward potential building heights, but also uh, square footage, total square footage. Can, can you just mm -hmm. clarify, can you just clarify, I've read it, but can you clarify what the language in our resolution says as it relates to square footage? I can have Diana clarify it. Diana? I'm sorry, what's the question about square footage? What's the, po the position? We relates to square footage in this resolution? Uh, well, overall, uh, in the in the section on on a density floor area, bulk, et cetera, currently it says that the zoning must be amended to reduce the density, height, and bulk for the development. So um, now, as per the amendment, we'll be making a more specific comment on the height. Um, it still stands that we are calling for an overall reduction of bulk, but the resolution doesn't specify what that reduction is. And Got it says it. To, to be uh, generally more consistent with um, with the existing context. The existing context. No, Andrew, it does. Okay. It, it does not. It does not specifically tag it because you it leaves flexibility for each development zone because what they trust had presented was that based on the overall square footage it is whoever comes to the plate and builds first gets if they choose it the largest portion of it so however that square footage works depends on how they sell the space okay and that okay. we did not comment on because that's they have to figure that out in their RFPs. Okay, we are now going to, do I hear a call to question for the full vote? I'm calling the question, I take that back. Am I seconded? I'm seconded, but I would like you once again, explain the two votes so everybody understands, Tammy. Two vote, yes. You are voting that the zoning would be if you do not meet the conditions set forth in the therefore be it resolved that we do not approve this zoning. If you vote yes, that is the vote. If you vote no, then you have, there is no bite on the apple. I understand the people who voted no in committee voted no because they wanted to see nothing on the island, but that is not what this is about in, in front of us. So a vote no means you don't approve that we've said and just goes down as a no vote towards the rezoning and they could potentially not take any of our considerations. If you vote yes, then it is, we support it. These changes must be made in order for us to support it. Tammy. It has to be 100, all of the conditions. 
Yes. Thank you, Laura. The, I think the, we. Should, uh, I think we should take a. And we and just so everybody knows, we've discussed this with the trust. The trust has already sent us a letter, and they are trying to work within the framework that we set out at the committee to address the concerns and issues that we have. And if okay, which is why Claire came this morning with the letter based on the committee vote and whatever was in the letter was what they've been able to do within the week that we had a committee vote to a full board vote. All right, we're gonna roll call on this because I want everybody to be super clear. Diana, can you get to the therefore Wait, be it resolved, Tam please? Tammy, can you hear me? What? It's yes. Laura, can you hear me? Yes. The. Uh, friendly amendment about the base plane of Liggett Hall. Does anybody know what the elevation of that is? We may be doing something detrimental with that because it's the center of the island. It's probably a lot higher than the shoreline. We may not want the, that, you know, maybe higher than is reasonable. Well, no, if that's the highest point, we don't want anything to be higher than that. Or no, no, anywhere. you're talking about the base plane, not the cupola. We're talking about the base plane. Right? Isn't the base plane the base of the building where you're measuring? Saying you know, just to use it as yeah. one of the reference points. No, Wait, no. we're talking about it's, two it's not the things. final. Vicki, please be quiet. I'm answering Laura's question. Please, I'm begging you. What Rosa asked, what Rosa asked was that Liggett Hall be considered as a, not the, but included as a. So it is not or, the right, reference the point, height, but, but I thought you also had a friendly amendment. She said for base plane. No, but the base for a point. But but the base plane is the bottom of the building, correct? That you're measuring. No, she only meant down. Not oh. necessarily base plane. Okay. Wait, aren't we talking? I just want to clarify. Are we? Buildings. There's two issues. One right. one is building height. But the other Which one is passed is, by friendly resolution, but as passed by amendment. Right, I understand that, but I thought there was also a friendly amendment that had to do with where you're calculating the base plane, which has to do with the resilience zoning. Am I? Oh no, it's not about where you're calculating the base plane. It's basically using the top of Liggett Height as it stands at. Okay, the that's the only friendly amendment point. we have. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In addition, it's the voted amendment. Right. Okay. There's the voted amendment, amendment about the height. There's only there's not another friendly amendment about where you're calculating the base of the building from. No, because okay. The, okay. and the trust has already said they're going to work on that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. All right. Yep. Question's been called. Lucian, please do roll call. Certainly. Here we go. All right, everyone. Please mute until your name is called, starting at the top. Oh, and Lucian, by the way, in in the resolution, we will note that, uh, please send it along with the letter from the trust, noting that we look forward to working on all the issues. Okay, wonderful, we'll package it all together. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, okay, starting at the top, at Russo. Yes. Burton. Yes. Blank. Recused. Blank recused. Brown Kennedy. Brown Kennedy, yes. Cameron. Cameron, yes. Cassell. Cassell, yes. Chang. Chang, yes. Chapman. Chapman, yes. Charcutian. Charcutian votes, yes. Cole. Yes. Call votes yes. Thank you. Kutia. Kutia abstains. Cunningham. Cunningham, yes. Curtis. Curtis, yes. Ehrman. Abstain. Thank you. Ehrman abstains. Flynn. Flynn, yes. Friedman. Friedman? Galloway? Galloway, yes. Goldstein? Goldstein. 
James? James agrees with others that this EPA thing belongs on Rikers Island, not Governor's Island, and votes no. Is that James yes? No. Okay, James opposed. Joyce? Joyce? Okay. Fried Friedman was, I lost connection and I voted, I vote yes. Okay, Friedman, yes. Okay. Uh, K, yes. Canell. Recuse. Kettering. Abstain. Kettering, abstain. Clementis. Clementis, yes. Lamory. Three, yes. Lewinson. Lewinson, abstain. Mahoney. Mahoney, yes. <laughs> Mahoney? Mahoney, yes. Oh, thank you. Mahoney, yes. Meltzer? Uh, if it's Meltzer, then yes. So yes. Mihals Mihalski? Yes. Mihalski, yes. I hawk. Abstain. Abstain. Bon Jovi? Yes. Bon Jovi, yes. More. Yes, more yes. Thank you. Schneck. Schneck, abstain. Star. Star, yes. Sung. Vera, yes. Weinstock. Weinstock, yes. Weinstock, yes. Weinstock, yes. G. Z, yes. Zelter. Zelter, no. Okay, thank you like to change his vote to no uh, right. okay the, 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 the vote has been changed to reflect that uh, there are 26 votes in favor three opposed six abstain two recused the ayes have it all right let's keep going fern thank you so much for helping chair this this has been a long process and I appreciate all of your input and your help in making everything go smoothly in the last couple months on this topic, as well as Alice and Diana and everyone else who participated. Thank you everyone for the marathon so far. Let's keep going. Next committee. Yeah. Oh, Bruce. I'm sorry. It's you, Bruce. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. it's good. I oh, can't loud talk. and clear. Good. Okay. So we have three resolutions. Uh, unfortunately, we'll we'll be quick, but I think we have to take each one separately. The first one, 100 Hudson Street, is absolutely minor. It's one window and an air conditioner. Uh, can we vote on that first, or do you want to do the votes at the end? We're going to uh, have to roll call to 50 and John, so you could just okay. take this. Uh, okay. So, um, I'm sorry, uh, Tammy, what's your instruction? Do a regular vote on this one. Okay, so let's do that. Eyes, um, knees. Yep. Um, does, for some reason, I didn't get the landmarks resolution. Does the first one in favor of it or against it? In favor. 100 Hudson is in favor. Jeff, take a look in the link in the in the chat for the link to the resolution. Thank you. Can I call the question? Please do. I did. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, here we go. So for 100 Hudson, uh, any opposed? Hearing none. Anyone abstaining? Hearing no one. Anyone recusing? Okay, you guys have it. Thank you. I have Thank a you. Question. I have a question. Trisha was here for the last meeting, but she didn't for the last vote. Did she vote for the last one? And is she voting for this one? She's here. I just could not unmute myself for the last one. My vote wouldn't have changed anything. May I have your vote for the last one? 
I abstain. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next issue is not a, is not a small one. Uh, it's 250 Water Street. I want to thank Paul Goldstein, Lucian, uh, Jennifer, Jason, and Tammy for putting this together with me. We had <laughs> two hours to do a massive issue. So you may know that um, the Howard Hughes Corporation has proposed a an immense two buildings as described in the second whereas on the parking lot at 250 Water Street, which is in the South Street Seaport Historic District. I'm going to try to break this down into categories just so we don't go on three pages. Uh, the first issue is describing the, um, the proposal. The second one is noting that the LPC has rejected nine proposed buildings over a quarter of a century for this site on structures that were either as large as this or smaller. And um, that has been a precedent died in stone. And we've quoted previous uh, uh, landmarks decisions on this matter. We've quoted from the decisions and also from the original designation report. Uh, also, you should note that uh, this has been proposed in regard to a quote, transitional district between the skyscrapers to the west and south, the, the, the financial district and the South Street Seaport Historic District, there is no such thing as a transitional district. And LPC has made that clear even 20 years ago when we were talking about adding such a thing. The law does not recognize a transitional district in any landmarks um, area. Uh, it, it's self-evidently, we could go into every little nuance of architectural detail and we did call out one at the bottom of the resolution, but it's on the face of it, so egregiously out of context, inappropriate. We're talking about, as you can see, a um, uh, 750,400 square foot uh, megalith in, in basically a four and five story 19th and 18th century landmarks district. It was landmarked for those 18th and 19th century four and five story buildings. Um, the, the Howard Hughes Corporation, which by the way, I should note, is, is quite receptive to certain community uh, interests. And although it's not transparent in its dealings with us in terms of building, they, they do seek diversity. They have been friendly to the arts. That all being said, they're coupling this with a ostensible scheme to finance um, the, um, uh, South Street Seaport Museum, which we will get to later. That coupling is not part of landmarks law, and we don't even know if the proposal will actually fly in terms of the next resolution, the next application, which is for an extension to the South Street Seaport Museum. So, so a lot of waters are muddied. There's an issue about the transfer of air rights uh, into the district. There's an issue of transferring from the outside to the inside. All of this breaks precedent. Uh, so I don't have to go into the character of architecture, our architecture in this, or we thought we didn't, except that the street wall at the bottom of the proposed towers are sort of a kitschy pastiche of the uh, real landmark buildings across the street. Questions? Roger, you had an amendment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm so sorry. I mean, this is a fantastic resolution. I, I'm very impressed with everybody. And I'm sorry I had to leave early uh, last evening. I, I, I wasn't uh, quite ready for a four-hour you, you made up. You made up for it tonight, Roger. <laughs> it's now. <laughs> text, text at 10.30 saying, can you vote? And I got it at 6 o'clock this morning when I woke up. Okay. <laughs> so these will be very brief because it's a great resolution. On the second page, on the whereas about the down zoning, I wonder after the second sentence where it says, uh, Sleep page. Walk led us led a successful effort in 2003 to rezone the C Seaport Historic District to six C62A with a maximum height of 120 feet. My friendly amendment is with unanimous city council member support. Please, please let's, uh, I 100%. 
Yeah. Secondly, um, we did this, if you remember, Bruce, uh, when we were dealing with Pier 17. Um, on the last page, uh, before the therefore be it resolved, I wonder if um, we would consider uh, two friendly amendments as follows. <clears throat> Whereas the community board has held a number of public hearings on the proposal, all meetings were well attended by over 150 people each meeting and a local petition of over 6,500 signatures and rising are all against uh, are all supporting the urgent rejection of the application as are HDC landmarks conservancy and MAS whereas and then the final one whereas CB1 is well known as pro development consider our work after 9/11 but CB1 is not for poor development that rides roughshod through the landmarks and zoning laws well, in regard to the first uh, friendly amendment, uh, I, I don't see why we can't have it, but you, you do recognize Rob. Bruce, oh, maybe, yes. I, I, I have a note of clarification for Roger. If you're planning on accepting it, we have to be a little bit careful here because yes, we had very robust engagement. And yes, we had well over 150 people sign on for each meeting, but not every one of the 150 Right. No. Was against. No. So I, you have to yeah. be. So so uh, uh, attended by over well well hundred well, by, attended by over one hundred and fifty people each meeting. Some for, some against, and a local petition of over. It's the local petition of six thousand five hundred. But um, if, if Jennifer is on, uh, if Jennifer, are are you? Are, can Jennifer speak? I added the petition, uh, whereas. Subsequent to our doing the um, the original document, and it is there. Uh, Jennifer, I'm I'm here. Yeah, yeah, that whereas is included. I, I don't know if if um, Roger's friendly amendment would be would want if you all would want that to be a whereas as itself or have it added on to the whereas. Can about you the can, can you tell system? me? I'm sorry because I'm flipping screens. Can you tell me where that existing whereas is? That should be in the second page of that second resolution. page. Let's see. Oh, there. I'm sorry, I have to flip back. The reason why I Did kept I... it to that is because the last we whereas. know it's the last whereas. Yeah, I see. Not the last one. It's not the last one on the second page on mine. Well, I'll flip to uh, I'll flip to the current community board screen. Right. The reason why I did that is because we know that over 6,000 people are opposed. We can't calculate those who are opposed and those who are in favor in the yep. public testimony. And I have never seen a resolution, uh, a petition, nor have you, I don't think, Roger, with over 6,000 names uh, yeah. uh, coming to us before. Sorry, that, that, that's fine. It, it's actually 6,500 and rising. Yeah. Uh, um, say, yeah, that. I have, I have say, say that. Say that, 6,500. We can change it to and rising. Now, but I would you. also just consider as adding HDC, MAS, and LC. The reason why I am of two minds about that is because they are all making their own statements. Historic Districts Council, when they do testify in front of LPC, whenever I've been there, are uh, are, are considered. Um, of one mind all the time, and I tried not to be tendentious or polemical in writing this resolution. We have so much already that we can throw at them that to get into theory and polemics about landmarking other than what's here, I thought would 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 detract from our okay position. okay no that that's a good point and then what what about the the point about the that we are pro development. We're not saying no to everything like how we've helped rebuild after 9 11, but when you ignore the landmarks law and the zoning laws, it's just not acceptable. Do I have to make that decision or can uh, can Jason chime in on it? Normally, Roger, you know, I'd automatic. Um, I, say, I think. Uh, I say I like what Roger's adding to it. And if nobody else out there really objects to it, then we just add it to the hard work that we put into this over the past 24 hours. 
You sound a little I sleepy, Jason. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry, like, Susan. Honestly, I'm, I, I know I'm one of the younger guys I here. Agree I agree as a study role. member, yes. I didn't hear what you said, I Susan. would agree with that, too. So can you read it exactly, Roger? Gotten, he's got it. I think the question is really only if everyone else on the committee is saying yes. Yes. To move things along. Somebody please let me know if Ken has it or Diana so it could get written into the resolution. Do we have the exact wording of the of the of the uh, amendment? I'll, I'll type it into the chat. I'll type it into the chat box. Okay. I, I want to put it somewhere that doesn't interrupt the flow of this, but okay. I, I was so, going to put it right at the end because it's a final closing point that we are pro development, but we're not pro breaking the law. I I oppose the idea that we're pro development. I don't think that we should be. Uh, I, I don't know what what purpose that serves. We are should be not identifying ourselves as anything other than evaluating each situation as it comes. And I, I just think that's no. Okay. And we were, okay. and we made and we made the point. I'm sorry. Uh, we did make the say? point on the parking lot, whereas that we are not opposed to development, it's there. We just want development within the, as you say, Roger, parameters of the law. But suggesting that the LPC is lawless <laughs> is carrying it one step further. Did you see the whereas regarding the parking lot? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you think it's not strong enough? Okay. No, because all really? the people that talked last night and the people who talked tonight are all saying, oh, I don't care about the landmarks law. I mean, I like it 450. Uh, for two 450 foot towers. They don't understand what the principles are, which, which I don't blame them for not understanding. But I think we as a community board have to point out we fought hard for the landmarks law. We fought hard for the zoning change and we just don't want, you know, uh, uh, just for it to be given up for, for, for uh, the whim of a, a development. <clears throat> uh, I, I okay. don't. Uh, so, okay. Bruce, let's <laughs> yes. make a decision, yes or no. And move on. Okay. I'd like to uh, call a question if there are I no think, hands I, up. I think we I should. I have a hand up. Bruce, you have hands up. So, Su Susan, Susan Cole. There, and, hold wait, on. Wait. I'm going to give the. Susan, hold on. I'm going to give the order so we can just get this done. It's going to go Susan, Mariama, Roger, you've already spoken, Alice, Tricia, Andrew. Okay. Shoot. I Susan. It's, it, it's a tangent, tangent, but I, I, I want to just say it. When they all talk and whenever anybody talks about affordable housing, that was my life's work. We don't know what they mean by affordable housing. Do they mean a studio apartment for $3,000? What do they mean? So when people tell me we're against affordable housing, we don't know what they mean. That's all I want to say. And don't get, don't get blindsided by that. Thank you, Susan. Hi, right, thank you. Mary, I'll comment, your next. Yeah, my comment is not going to change the vote, I don't think, but I wanted, I still wanted to have some of it on the record um, because I'd signed up to speak to the in the public session and we didn't have time. Um, I just wanted to bring another perspective uh, to this. Uh, I, I've done it previously before. I'm a resident of Southbridge. I'm also a, a black Cherokee in Catawba. Um, and probably African descent, that, that's part, that part is presumed. And a lifelong resident of Southbridge Towers, so I feel like I would have to speak on this. Um, December 10th, it was reported that 37 top U.S. Com companies had vowed to hire 1 million Black people over the next 10 years. And December 11th, New York City controller Scott Stringer tweeted that, quote, racism must be fought with concrete action, not corporate slogans, end quote, and called upon the city to put pressure on major companies to release diversity data. Whether by way of personal private boycott or through my vote and or influence on any given topic, refusing to support a restaurant with a publicly transphobic CEO's liquor license, and once going three summers without sandals because I couldn't find any that were made in the U.S., I've long spoken out against companies that mistreat their workers, use foreign slave or child labor, or discriminate based on race, gender, sexuality, or disability, be it blatantly or more subtly through their hiring, programming, or social action. I call upon others to begin to notice subconscious biases 
and to consider the character of a company when deciding whether or not to do business with it. By all definitions of the word, HHC is an outstanding example of diversity in a severely lacking district and should be at the top of any list of developers here where public assets are involved and approvals are necessary. I ask that the city provide in the future neutral venues for public engagement where those of us who've been absent from discussions can be educated on what developers like this and the city are trying to do and decide for ourselves like informed adults whether we're in favor or not rather than to have insiders or people who were involved in specific aspects of a topic on either side to tell us that we're against or for thank you thank you uh, okay tom uh, I uh, thank you. I thought that was really powerful um, at, for sharing that. I'm uh, affected by what you just said. Um, I, uh, I I'm uh, a thir a 25 year Southbridge resident, and uh, and Southbridge and the the board does not speak for me either. Um, I am a uh, a father of three. I am uh, uh, a community board. You know, obviously on the community board. And I have a business and I operate historic sailing ships in lower Manhattan. And I, uh, I am, I'm sad and uh, upset by the tone. I, I'm, I'm going to have to recuse myself for this vote because I've done business with Howard Hughes and I expect, uh, that I will be, uh, returning, uh, at one point, uh, you know, I'm expecting to return to pier 17, which is, uh, part of the promise, uh, another promise kept by the Howard Hughes Corporation uh, when they closed it down to redevelop it um, and uh, uh, the Pier, Pier 17. So I am in support of this development. I think that the, uh, the, the, the incursion, you know, over of a, onto the parking lot uh, of, of this tower while um you know while i'd prefer no buildings ever you know uh, go up on some in, in some level and I'd, I'd like a low profile i grew up on the lower east side um i see this as giving so much back to our community that we've wanted desperately for so long and uh and there's no other no other proposal there's a lot of generalities about oh well we could do this we could do that there's not one concrete example of an op of of a, a, another way to keep the museum operational as a cultural institution, they are uh, they are one of my primary sources of uh, of skilled labor because they are growing a uh, they are training skilled mariners and keeping alive a craft and a culture in Lower Manhattan that would be gone without them. And uh, you know, and I employ up to 90 people and I got I usually get most of my really skilled workers have had some very deep experience and uh, and training uh, with the museum either they were attracted and stayed in lower Manhattan and, and worked here because of the museum um, and that's why they're and available to me as a as a resource but my business might not survive and thrive as well without them being a feeder um, to my uh, of of really talented people, so I, I encourage you that to think about what culture and what landmarks mean, and not just mean pretty buildings that are that are there, um, and uh, and and also the actual you know vitality of a culture and uh, and our culture and New York City and um, and without them, I think you have buildings and you know whether that's Faneuil Hall, which is basically soulless. From my estimation, you know, uh, you really are losing something by letting the museum go to pot or disappear uh, with with uh, with the attitudes I've heard. I, I just I can't tell you str how strongly enough uh, I think that this is a mistake and that we should be supporting this development. And I think they've taken a lot of efforts to uh, to to, you know, to to give context um, and the buildings they're covering up. Our Southbridge, and I, I love it here. I love the community, 
but they're not pretty buildings. And uh, and it's just across the street. And I, I think the the anger and the the ire that you know that that this the righteous indignation that I'm hearing both in this resolution offends me. Um, and I uh, and I think that we have a very good partner right now. I don't think the you know the, I didn't like the original uh, um, ULERP, and I was I was I was you know very affected by it. The original ULERP for Pier 17, but I think they're they're telegraphing it. They've given us a lot of warning. Uh, and and give and engaged and and this is a very different process and for you for people to go backwards and say uh oh you know they're not acting Tom, or they didn't act right Tom. Uh, i'm out of time i'm done okay <laughs> you are all right anyway Sorry. I, I i'm really upset thank you thank you've made you. I, I think you've made thank all your you. points okay all right so thank you jason uh then francis I, I just, I just wanted to one. say um, I was kind of just sad to hear that this connection uh, the museum has made with anybody uh, and that you know, we're going to, you know, I, and I don't disagree with all of the things that Tom's like on Tom's uh, points in terms of revitalization, but it just came up so much in the presentation and so many people that were actually really just involved with the museum uh, currently we're, are, are pushing, you know, we, we need you guys in the community to save us. Everybody else besides the 6,000 people on the thing, on the petition. And it feels unfair, mm -hmm. uh, frankly. Uh, and so that's my last comment on the like social issues of it. Otherwise, I think that the buildings are too tall in, in the towers. And Tom talks about ugly buildings like Southbridge. But and Southbridge may be, quote, ugly today in for its looks, but in terms of its bulk, it's a pretty good transition from a five-story building. And socially, obviously, it it's debatable, but it provided, you know, good housing for a lot of people. And, um, and so that's it. I think it's too tall, and I think it's really sad that we have to bear the bad management of a small museum in a great, great, great part of the center of the universe by getting a trade-off from anybody. Thank you. Okay, Jason, Francis. Uh, yes. Susan my Cole big, has her hand up. Uh, my Trisha, it's your hand. Uh, uh, is, are you finished? Okay. My, uh, Go ahead, Francis. The, the most important issue for me regarding this whole process is the potential for the environmental impact that it will have on the community. I don't care about views and, you know, my view, whatever. At the shadow studies, I want to see some more information about that. And in terms of the, the pictures, uh, the renderings that they showed us, you could see it's going gonna, it's gonna to put that section of the community in a whole tunnel cave um and i i just uh i just have strong feelings about the potential for the environmental uh impact that it's going to have on the community and i'm a little disappointed at the the um a little a lot disappointed uh uh in the the museum's history of not being able to fundraise they have all those people on the board they haven't done any fundraising to raise money to help the museum out. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, I don't know. I And the museum has never really impressed me uh, with any kind of programming that, in, that made it inviting for me to go to see the museum. So I'm, I'm, I don't have any feelings towards the museum, any positive feelings anyway, that's it. Thank you so much. You're muted, Tammy. Wishing I could mute everybody and we go. Okay, Trisha. You didn't call on me. Susan, have you? Trisha, Susan, Paul. And after those three go, I'm going to call the question so everybody knows. 
I'm sorry, there are 10 more resolutions to come. Are all these comments really needed, people? It's 1045. This is ridiculous. We're all just going to vote no anyway. Yeah. I'm just going to say that <clears throat> since it hasn't been mentioned, um, I too feel as though this is just, I, I feel sad about where we are with developers saving museums um, and, and education. <clears throat> it's, it's so troubling to me, but beyond that, is this height it's unimaginable this construction and then the the complete shadow over this brand new school i find it to be dangerous to be constructing this in this space and i just cannot i can't wrap my head around the lack of light on peck slip so it's a no deal for me i'm sorry <clears throat> okay thank you moving moving on uh, I think, yeah, I think that Jason expressed it all, but I want up, up for me as well. I want to say this. Um, there is no guarantee. In fact, Howard Hughes has said they plan to sell the site. That's what they said a long time ago. They had uh, uh, various options. They want an approval if, uh, of something so it's easier to sell. Don't lose sight of the overall picture here. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Susan. Paul Goldstein, I'm seriously going to ask you, you spoke at the public session and every meeting. I think, I don't mean to be rude, you know I'm trying to get very fair here, but it is late. I haven't spoken much tonight compared to many of the other board members. So if you can all just speak, okay? What? I just want to One remind minute, Paul. members Thank you. that we're voting on a landmarks resolution. This is to determine the appropriate of a building has started this year. We all know that the museum has been on its luck, and it's frankly been sandy and poorly operated. I only have tried to help, and this board has been nothing but supportive of them every time they've come to us for any type of support. But this is going way over the line. I Agree, let's call the question and put it to a vote. Is that it, Tammy? Motion for the question with the motion for the question to be called. I second it. Let's uh, go. We yeah, added absolutely. one, uh, we added one amendment of Rogers, which was, and I forget what it was, first amendment. Does that, does that need a vote? It's a friendly amendment that we approved. Okay, okay. It is a friendly. So Thank you. the only thing that you have to tweak is that we don't, you can't say we have never received a petition with over 6,000 signatures. Well, we can we say it's highly unusual. Time. What's that? First, you don't know that for us. You can't guarantee that. We have received petitions before. We didn't fact check it. So you have to. Then we'll put it in the positive tweak it a little. that we have received a petition with over 6,500 signatories and counting opposed that, that just say it that way. That's a friendly amendment. Now that's questions have been called. Questions have been seconded. Second. Let's do the vote. Tammy, would you like this to be a roll call vote? We have one more resolution on landmarks. Whatever is faster, Lucian. That's my role. I don't know. I don't know if this is gonna be a close vote or not. I, I think if it's not a close vote, just asking for opposition. I'm gonna try that. All right, so I'm going to ask everybody, uh, I'm going to infer who's in favor by hearing who's opposed. So if you are opposed, um, please let me know your name. Catch Voting. Voting. opposed. Question. Isn't, isn't, the, isn't the resolution opposed? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. If you vote yes to this resolution, you're voting against Howard Hughes, correct? Bruce, would you would you Or voting uh, against? Correct. If you are voting yes on the resolution, you are voting against the height, density, and bulk. Yes, correct. Yes, this resolution speaks to LPC to not approve the That's proposed right. development. So by saying you're in favor, you're telling the LPC do not approve this. If you're opposed by saying yes, you are agreeing with the last three, therefore be it resolves that. If you just read those three, that's what you would be agreeing to by saying yes. Yeah. If you say you're opposed to this resolution, you don't want this resolution to go forward. That's 
as simple as I can make it. Um, okay, so if you're opposed, please speak your name and say opposed. Ketring opposed. Ketring opposed. Thank you. James opposed. James opposed. Schneck opposed. Schneck opposed. K opposed. K opposed. Clementis opposed. Clementis opposed. Hearing no other opposed. Uh, abstentions, please. Zelter abstain. Zelter abstain. <coughs> Anyone else? Hearing none. Recusals. This Burton. is. Uh, I I asked for a recusal. I'm sorry. This is Laura Star. Laura Star recusal. Laura Star recusal. Burton yep. recusal. Re yes. Burton recusal. Any other recusals? Okay. Hey, Lucian, Lucian, yes. Lucian, yes. Lucian, sorry, it's Elter. I misspoke. I, I'm a yes. I'm not a recusal. I'm abstain. I'm a yes. Sorry. Zelter in favor? Uh, uh, yes, I'm in favor. I misspoke. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, the motion passes. Okay, can we make sure we put the next resolution up for the therefore be it resolved and then take a vote on this. This is for the South Street Seaport Museum buildings, right, Bruce and John that Street? Is, that is correct. I want to note to the board that the time constraints that we had, this was all heard last night, there are punctuation and grammar errors that will be corrected. The bulk of it is as, as written. In short, the committee uh, liked the design uh, uh, on in general of this proposal and the restoration component component of it is fine. There's a new building proposed that would be uh, an addition to the uh, current Seaport Museum. Again, you should know that the uh, applicants are putting these two together since one would sort of finance the other, but they're being heard by LPC as two separate applications, which indeed they are. You should also know that there is no mechanism whereby this this matter, this this um, this new building of John Street, will ever be built. There's no legal or contractual guarantee. So there is some worry that that it's a sort of a sop to approve the other building which we've just rejected. If there are any questions, I'd be yeah. happy to take them. Does that mean a sop? Bruce, it Bruce, in order to also underscore that, both uh, there is a question out to LPC about the ripeness of the application to include John Street at this time, based on the lack of you know, agreement or memorandum or legal documentation that CV1 has been provided at this time. We have Thank not you. gotten an answer yet, so we are proceeding forward. If we do have an answer, then I'll bring it back to the board. Thank you. In and of itself, in in a in a blind universe, uh, the the design isn't bad. Um, we're just talking about a South Street Seaport Museum addition and certain restoration projects on the existing buildings. That's all we're talking about here. Let's just call the question. Everyone, seconded. Uh, that's. I am going to assume that everybody whose hands up. More hands up from 250. If your hand has not been up in terms of you wanted to speak, please put it down or speak now. I'm going to speak now. I think even though they're tying them, that's why I was the only no vote. I think it's a mistake for us to vote yes on this, even though the design may be good, but I can't see it as a solo and there's no way to fund. Everybody will have to do as they they think, but I feel there's you're getting the 50 million to build a building. It, it's also confusing and it's not clear. I hope you get some statement, Tammy, uh, on what they're doing here. Thank you. Okay, questions been called and seconded. Let's take it. 
Okay, stand by. Here we go. One seven three six nine. John, anyone opposed? I am. Susan Cole is opposed. Susan Cole opposed. More opposed. More opposed. Kuchia opposed. Kuchia opposed. Cunningham opposed. Cunningham opposed. Lamory opposed. Lamory opposed. Clementus opposed. Clementus opposed. Friedman opposed. I like where they're going with this. Friedman opposed. Yeah. You, you, everybody understand. So I should just vote no. You're agreeing with. Or comments about by voting no, it's a, it's a, you know, it makes a statement about it. So I agree with what she said, and I vote no. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. For that reason, Cassell votes no. Cassell, no. Abstentions. Mahoney abstain. Mahoney abstain. Curtis ab Curtis abstains. Curtis Brown Kennedy abstains. Abstain. Brown Kennedy abstains. Zongas abstains. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Give me a minute, Lucian. Okay. The last one I have is Brown Kennedy abstains. Sung abstains. Sung abstains. Burton recuse. Okay, wait, hold on, Tom. Any, anyone else abstaining? Blank abstains. Blank Elter. abstains. Did, did someone say Andrew Zelter? Andrew? No. Meltzer, not Zelter. Meltzer, sorry. <laughs> Meltzer abstain. And K, I spoke when Alice uh, did, so if you didn't catch me. You said K abstain? I abstain, yes. K abstains. Okay, recusals. Star recuses. Recuse. Star recuses. I heard another voice. Recuse. Excuse your name one more time. Burton. Burton recuses. Okay. With that, please I believe that the eyes have it. Six opposed, six abstain, two recuse. Motion carries. Let's move on. Thank you. Next committee. Oh, thank the good Lord. The quality of life. It's are we next? Everyone that's over the hump. I can't hear. It's a quality of life. Um, yes. I'm looking at myself the, uh, right. Yes, yes, quality of life, Pat. Time. Okay, so I'm going to yep. let Miriamma take the rezo, which she and Justine wrote. Is the rezo the first item? Yeah, let's do it as the first item. We'll be now. Yeah. Okay. So I believe it's pretty straightforward. What we're doing is asking that the bills that have been put forth by our assemblywoman and our senator um, in co-sponsorship, as well as some bills that are stuck in committee, be brought to the floor immediately in emergency housing relief. So we can start there, and then if there are questions, I've got a question. I'd like mm -hmm. to make a friendly amendment. Okay. Um, can you, because there is so much dialogue that's going on right now about hotel and commercial conversion and our, and how that will work and what the fastest way to do that, can we take that out of this resolution? Um, where is, you mean where we have the real estate board where we would, Calling upon the real estate board is that in that section. It's the language about the hotel and commercial conversions that you've gotten there. That's right. Near on the, the bottom, one to, there, be it therefore further resolved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take it out and 
Why? Because they're working on stuff already and we, we may want to take a look at that more on a local level and ensure what we're asking for. And not all hotels are the same in terms of uh, what kind of, com um, there are people who own in some hotels are not just straight hotels. Some hotels are already residential and how those mesh. I think it stands, the resolution stands pretty strong on its own. I just wanted to, you can tell me no, but that you don't, would be you my don't believe, suggestion. You don't believe that this supports that? I mean, in the borough so president she's just- It should be something else because she, she doesn't, She's saying it should be it it doesn't belong in here because it it it's about convert it commingles it yeah. commingles something. Oh, I see. It's not I see. A, I see. I see. Okay. It's it's. I'd like I'd like the housing team to take that topic up, but I think it commingles it in here in a way that and it's it, not. It belongs as in a separate as resolution. You're suggesting, right? You're suggesting it belongs yes, in a separate resolution. So it just means yes, you, I mean, you you authored this section, so I would. I did. I mean. I, I will. I, I, I obviously will will bow down to what uh, what Pat and, and Maria, what you say, and and the committee says, and T and Tammy says. But um, I think it's important to put it out there because these are all the things that are being discussed, and and there are. You uh, know what? I don't have my, a set on this one to put Justine, it to a bill. Justine and Miriam, my feeling is the resolution is very dense at the moment. And we can take that out and write another resolution next month that refers to, but that I mean, you two wrote it. I'm gonna... No, that's okay. I guess, I guess what I, my only issue is, and I'm going I'm to shut up this late. Uh, my only issue is, is that I really want to start focusing on condos versus rentals. And okay, that's we're never going to get there. No, no, I know. But, but that's a, that's so, a different conversation, right? But yes, you can temper but, the language. Justine, you can temper the language to ask the city to move, you know, maybe to subsidize hotel conversions where possible, but I don't want to spook the city. It's really a strongly worded resolution. We've been advocating for it. I think it would be better to take it up as a separate okay. topic. And I, I, I'll accept, just... I accept the friendly amendment. I think we, okay. should, we can... I think we can pull out the whole thing. We're not doing away with it. Right, we can just take out the whole plug it out, oh. put it on another one in January. This is not part of the emergency, right? It's not part of the crisis. Right. So we don't have to address <laughs> it right now. After it says the taxpayers are in period, yeah. right? The evictions, right. evictions are the crisis. Yeah. Trisha, yeah. is your hand up for me? I think her hand was still up from before. It hasn't gone down yet. Okay. Okay. So anybody else? I only see Meltzer. I'm taking my hand down and calling the question. Somebody seconding? Second? I second it. Second. My hand seconds it. Thank you. Stand by. Here we go. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstained? Anyone recused? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Dean, for doing the yeoman's job on the on the resolution. I'm going to do two reports, and I'm going to do them really fast. I'm going to skip the report on um, our our lovely and wonderful conversation we had with Victor Bach and Sam Stein, who are housing specialists. Um, I'm going to go to the report on 105. Um, 105 Washington Street, which is, uh, they're going to start construction in nine months. It's going to be a safe haven temporary housing facility. Uh, Co-ed, they're going to be 84 beds. It's in, if, any, if you're familiar with Washington Street, it is south of Albany. It is formerly, it was a Buddhist temple. It's a beautiful Please. facade to the building, and I'm glad they're saving it. Uh, it's going to be 84 beds. Uh, it's like I said, mixed use, mostly singles, some doubles. Um, homeless people will be able to bring their their pets, which is one of the reasons why many homeless people do not want to go into any kind of housing because pets are not allowed. So they'll be coming back. This is CUCS Center for Urban Community Service. They've been around a long time. They have other facilities that they're running up uptown. 
Um, it was great that they came nine months before their starting project, as opposed to telling us today and starting tomorrow. So we will get, we will have them back and they'll be doing much more community engagement. Uh, just a quick update on 52 wow. William Street. Um, as some of you know, an organization called Black Vets for Social Justice. They're the ones that have staff there and are running the um, program at the moment for the 33 residents that 33 men who are living there. We still have no ruling. We're waiting for the judge to rule on the Lucerne and whether the men from the Lucerne will be moving downtown. When we get that information, when the judge rules, um, I'll do a report on that. That's it. Uh, Pat, may I just thank you? Uh, oh, may I just make a comment about the uh, 105 Washington Street? Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. We had a lot of people, uh, several people from the public there, and their main concern was people, uh, uh, the, the criminal uh, records of the uh, participants of the at the shelter, and uh, them urinating uh, in the neighborhood and the drugs and. Uh, things that I thought were really uh, ex mm. elaborate, considering that the people, some of the people, when people were working in the area, used to do more, used to do worse things in the neighborhood. But I just thought they were being really. Yeah, they would have well, they were, I mean, it was great that many people were in favor of this type of housing, supportive housing. And um, like I said, the, the organization that's running it, they were up front. They answered any of yeah, those questions yeah. and they'll be back and they'll be involved in the community. And then people from who live, who are going to be living directly next door were not opposed to it. So they're a great organization. Perfect. They're fabulous. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Tammy, sorry. And it, I love you guys, but we need to move forward. Jeff, Jeff. But we need Jeff. T Tammy, no, sorry. Can, can we we got to get to life. I'm asking if we cannot have reports. There's seven resolutions left. I'm not saying if we're going to go past 11 15. Jeff, if you'd let me speak, that's where I'm going. Okay. Next is licensing. We are going to skip Battery Park City this evening. And apologies, Justine. We'll be happy to share whatever reports the authority has given and post them on our website. We're no going problem. licensing waterfront, um, uh, youth and ed, and environmental notice, and then transportation. If you have environment, skip as well. This morning. sorry, Alice, um, because it's all reports. All right. So resolutions here here. only. It's eleven oh five. Susan, uh, you're on. Five five Greenwich Street. Uh, they came before us. There were no problems with it. We put in a number of stipulations of uh, to their hours, and um, they're replacing another restaurant that was there that uh, posed no problems for the community, and uh, we approved it. That's it. So Call the question. Okay. Call the question. I'll second it. So, uh, I'm gonna. All all perfect. Paper. I think we're gonna. Okay, I'm gonna. Yeah, I have to do. Oh, this. with your nose and whatever. Any any opposition? Any no. abstention? Any recusal? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Let's hit. Uh, okay. One resolution, Paul. That's it. Two resolutions. Okay, the battery conservation yeah. solution concerns uh, dogs damaging and the gardens. Those are all portions of the park. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Photo. Perfect. We're going to take them together. Oh, okay. So let's go. The second one is uh, we got a proposal. A uh, couple of architects who the Holland Tunnel Brewery. The committee liked a lot of what they saw, and they made some suggestions incorporating resiliency. Basically, supporting it and work with them to sponsor additional community engagement. Oh. I see no hands up. Call the question. Here we go. Any opposition? 
Uh, Galloway opposes the first motion. Galloway opposes battery conservancy. Yes. Any other my, my hawk opposes the first one. My hawk opposes battery conservancy. Resolution. Meltzer abstains on the conservancy. Any other Mel abstains. Mel abstains on the conservancy. Burton. Gio objects to, says no to the. Um... Slow down. Burton abstains to the battery conservancy resolution. Who's the next? Gia um, says no to the battery conservancy resolution. Cuccia opposed to battery conservancy resolution. Brown, I'm sure he abstains to that to one. first one. I'm sorry, say your name again. Brown Kennedy abstains to the first one. Brown Kennedy abstains to battery conservancy resolution. James opposed number one. James opposed battery conservancy resolution. Star recuses battery. Star recuses battery conservancy resolution. Yeah. Uh, because I sit on their board, I think I have to recuse from it. Okay. So Tammy's uh, vote will reflect that she's recusing herself from the battery conservancy resolution vote. Clementis um, abstains. Clementis abstains from the battery conservancy resolution. Burton has to change from abstain to recuse. Uh, really, hold one second, Tom. Uh, Clementis abstains from battery conservancy. Yes. Okay. Tom Burton recuses from battery conservancy. Yes. Okay. K Anyone abstains. Else? K abstains from battery conservancy. K abstains battery conservancy. Hearing no one else. Lucy, let me know when you've um put in you're gonna have things. to call the, you're gonna have to call the votes i placed in i don't think i had i i had okay. everyone i'm gonna call the votes that are placed in and you let me know if i missed you burton recuse brown kennedy re recuse or abstain it's abstain okay abstain um kuchia oppose galloway oppose Canell, I'm sorry, K, abstain. Meltzer, recuse. Star, recuse. And that's all I have. Are we missing anyone? James, uh, opposed. James, opposed. Canell, abstain. Canell, abstain. <laughs> We have James oppose, Canel abstain. Lucy, let me know once you have those in. You can continue. Okay. The motion carries for Battery Conservancy and Holland Tunnel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Uh, Youth and Ed has one resolution, two resolutions. If it's possible to take those together, if they're non-confrontational, Jeff, I assume you are presenting tonight, or Tricia. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm not sure which. I'm here. I don't awesome. Know. Thanks. Um, so, so, I I think they could be taken together, but I think it's best if I just tell you what they are. The first one is in support of the Harbor School in their quest to get the long overdue uh, pool that will make their school whole. They have been moved to Governor's Island because of access, to, you know, giving them access to the water, but they can't graduate with their degree if they can't swim. And presently, they have no pool. The DOE funded it, never cited it. They don't have a gym. Um, we've been here a hundred times, so it's it's really a resolution supporting them getting both a temporary solution in the form of a Mirtha pool or a barge pool, and then the permanent solution, which they would like to be site 515, and we're in the middle of working that out with the SCA and the trust. So that one is in favor of that. The other one is um, to push our principals, teachers, 
essential school staff and after school program workers up in line in terms of getting the vaccine. We were surprised to see how down the list they were. And so this is about having them come behind um, essential healthcare workers and uh, uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, we would like for them to come after, after those groups. So that is what the second one is about. So if no one thinks that's controversial or has any questions, I could take them together. Um, I have a question on the uh, uh, COVID vaccine one. I, I'm fully in favor of it, but I understood that teachers were already in phase two, which is the next phase after the current phase. There was some controversy about that in that as I did the dive to get information, it wasn't clear whether the NYPD and the fire department would be before them or not. They were still in that grouping, but it didn't seem like they were a priority within that group, Jeff. So I just wanted to give them a Okay, that makes sense. Lift. Call to question. All right. Uh call again. Yeah, that's and in. let's come together. I'm pulling them up. Here we go. So everyone, please uh, just wait to say whatever section I'm in in terms of the opposed abstention recuse. It goes a little faster. Anyone opposed to any of these resolutions? Anyone abstaining from any of these resolutions? Anyone recusing from any of these resolutions? I thought we had a, is this a roll call or we uh, have another one? There's. Sadly, we have one, we have another one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hearing no recusals, abstentions, or uh, uh, people opposed, uh, both of these motions carry. Thank you very much, everybody. Alice, I'm sorry. Um, if you are looking forward to your governor's island and your EPC report, please join Alice in January. She'll be going over all of this stuff again. I'm delighted okay. not to be giving Trans it. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, take us home. This is roll call for Rebel and administrative code. Which one do you want to do first and which one do you want to do roll call on? Lucian would probably find it easier to do roll call on Revel. Well, the I'm report call would both. probably you be an idea. Yeah, Revel might be easier roll call. I was going to say, because number four is probably going to be unanimous. For, yeah. So. Do you want to start with, uh, well, then I'll do number four first so that you get to roll call yes, last. Please. One. And this is Please. just a local law to amend the administrative code. This is just like with the idling of engines. What it's saying is people who are not law enforcement and not DOT workers, so all of us, can go out there and complain and file a complaint. And as this points out, in 1,320 feet of a school, I'll show you a map. It covers really our whole district. If you see any car, including those with placards, including even NYPD vehicles, that are in bicycle lanes, bus lanes, sidewalks, crosswalks, or fire hydrants, you can file, you go to the next one, uh, and you will get 25% of the fines that are collected. So it is turning over enforcement to the population. So we could complain about the tracker, uh, placard parking, yeah? Yes. If they park Oh, someone's got to second that. Second it. Can I second it? Can we all second and it? Betty is like fucking <laughs> wheel of hell. And people are losing all the questions. I, yeah, Sorry, I think can I, I, can I ask one quick like question? Someone... I was trying to ask one quick question. Can I try and put it forward? Sorry, Andrew. As it, as it relates to. I apologize. I didn't get to you before, Andrew. I've got a crying child. So take the question, call the vote. I'll be back. So, Betty, does this assume that there's appropriate or applicable signing uh, in all of these or that comply with all of these provisions? So 1,320 feet from a school, et cetera? Oh, could you go one more slide? 
Lucian? There's the map of our district. And so you right. can see the, the red dots in the schools, the purple yep. areas, the only areas that are outside the 1,320. Wow. And, and there's there's signage that would advise everyone as such that you cannot no. be standing. These The rules for uh, how DOT has to set the rules for what people have to submit in their complaint. I assume it's a photograph. If I can clarify further, um, all the things that you can report are already illegal. Um, it's just that uh, for uh, a, a non member of uh, New York City enforcement to be able to call in the infraction and claim uh, and claim the 25% bounty, uh, it would have to be within that distance from a school. Um, but it would certainly still be illegal, even if it is outside of that distance for any member of enforcement to to write that ticket. So um, that, that that doesn't change. This law was put forward by council members Stephen Levin and uh, Corey Johnson because of the outrage in their own districts for the amount of placard abuse and lack of enforcement. And call into whom? Excuse me? So, so if, it, if, it, if it resembles the, the DEP version of this for idling, um, a person would document the infraction according to how DOT writes the rules and it would be submitted to likely DOT and then the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings would, would notify the owner of the vehicle of the um, of essentially the summons or the ticket. Yes, no, so the DOT the, would be charged with having something on their website where the citizens could file. Uh, okay, that's the, thank you. It would go directly to the court system to handle it. Okay, um, if that, Andrew, if that um, satisfies your inquiry, I'm going to move to the uh, calling of the question. Okay, I'm fine. Thank yeah, you. I thought it was already seconded. I, yeah, I seconded. Yeah. I seconded yeah. again. Okay, uh, anyone in opposition to this? No one. Anyone abstaining from this vote? Zelter abstain. Zelter abstain. Is this the okay? Sorry. This is local law. Uh, Galloway abstains just because I don't fully understand it. But I abstain. abstains. Cole abstains as well. Cole abstains. Okay. Uh, anyone recusing? Oh, sorry. Kettering abstains as well. Kettering abstains. Local law. Schneck abstains too. Brown Schneck Kennedy abstains. abstains. Oh, please. Brown Kennedy abstains. Uh, Clementis abstains. <laughs> Clementis abstains. Okay. Uh, with that, the motion carries. Great. And if you go back, we'll go to the first resolution. Yes, Raffle. thank you. The Revel, the Revel mopeds. Go down one more and people can see kind of a little bit for a reminder. Um, this is an app based. Keep in mind, sharing. this is roll call. Right, this is roll call. This is about, uh, it says it goes for supporting Revel as a provider of a moped share. But it goes into also a law that is being looked at now, which is regulating moped share in general. Because right now, an unlimited number of people could come in and start up their own businesses. Uh, so it's also asking to please move towards getting the legislation and having the DOT continue to write the rules to regulate the industry. Where's the resolution? It's in the link. If you click the bit.ly that's in the chat and go to transportation, it's in there. I can certainly ask Bruce for it there to go it off. There you go. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Get down to therefore be it resolved. There we go. Keep scrolling. Okay. 
Keep scrolling. Sorry, why, why do we single out Revel in terms of our support? Because right now they're the only one. I mean, from OPED share. Yes. Yeah, they were they were the ones who came upon the scene. They have been acting very responsibly. Uh, they have. They, when the law went out, in fact, it was very strong support for them. They are used by a lot of groups. In fact, Catholic Charities depends on them in the Bronx. But there are also discounts to veterans, and there's a 40% discount to anybody who is on any kind of federal, state, or city financial assistance, including NYCHA and any, any program. I'm the last person to want to extend this meeting right now, but Andrew's got a point. You should change that last uh, revel to be something more generalized. Mobile, uh, moped companies, whatever you want to say. I also wouldn't characterize them as as great as people are. They clogged the streets. They've had two deaths. They are operated uh, really they've shut down because of two deaths. They park all over the streets and keep the streets from being cleaned on cleaning days. So just going to point that out. So vote no. Yes. I would just vote like no, the... but I'm also pointing out an opinion. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can we say that since they came back, they've been under DOT rules and there have been no real significant problems. Well, except that. The... Well, you have to be fair that the fact is once they start regulating. That... They're still but... parked all over the street and the street clears can't get by them on cleaning days. And they're Are still you taking along questions the by hand, hand, hand or randomly? Because I have my hand up. I, I don't know how you're doing this. Alice, I think I didn't see the hand. Bruce, you're next. We should go. Sorry. It's Thank kind of you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that I agree that it should be general, uh, not just Revel, because they're uh, liable to the other companies entering the fray. And I also want to say that uh, there are issues that I've seen anecdotally with Revel um, renters, but I do think in general, it's a good idea. I mean, imagine if it were 1910 and someone said, we're gonna give everyone a car. <laughs> so this is, this is much, much easier than that one. Okay, well, I can tell you. Nick, Colin, Bill, and then Trisha. <laughs> I just wanted to comment that I, in my lifetime have hundreds of thousands of miles of motorcycle riding. And um, every person I taught how to ride a motorcycle uh, ended up ended up with some some massive injury at some point. I think that these things are dangerous and I think that people should be much more cautious about <coughs> running them and uh, the I've I've spoken to a number of people that have used them, and they said, "Boy, I'm so lucky I got off of that alive. I'll be more careful next time." I think these things are dangerous, and we're kind of treating them uh, with kids and everyone else that you can just go out and and drive these things. And they're then, and I, if I had a kid, I'd just go, "Wow, this stuff! i I really want to make you cautious about this," and I don't see anyone putting on the brakes. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you for the comment, Bill Kulamentis. Mm. No, I'm good. <laughs> Bill, and I thought you were going to say call the question. Mm. Call the question. Call the question. Second. Second. Call the question. <laughs> you got it. Sorry. Everyone. Let's vote. Here comes the roll call vote. Everyone, please put your microphones on mute until I call your name, starting at the top. So, so they have in here, is that correct? To generalize it? Oh. Oh, that's right, Betty. I'm sorry, you're yeah, correct, Andrew. I, I, Betty, I'm did you accept that? Gen yeah, I'm not going to generalize it. Why? Because there isn't anybody else. It doesn't matter. They may, others may come. Well, actually, they may not. I can tell you, first of all, I can't tell you if they're responsible or not because they're not here. I can also tell you that Polly Trottenberg, in her testimony before the city council, suggested against allowing multiples. Why? She used the pattern of uh, bike share. And for instance, when they went in and let co competition go into Staten Island, it collapsed because there really wasn't enough money in any of it. It was 
It was no regulation. It was poorly uh, monetized. It didn't work. So I can tell you DOT is not enamored of the safety that came from that kind of competition. So I don't know if there are going to be multiples. I don't know. So I don't want to generalize on unknowns. Okay, let's vote on the unamended resolution. Second. Okay, here we go. Starting at the top, Amoruso. Abstain. Burton. Abstain. Blank. Abstain. Brown Kennedy. Abstain. Cameron. Cameron, no. Cassell. Abstained. Chang. Chang abstained. Chapman. Yes. Charcutian. Abstain. Chu. Oh, no, no Chu. Cole. No. Cole, Kuchia. no. Kucha, you said no. Cunningham. Nope. Cunningham, no. Curtis. Abstain. Curtis abstain. Ehrman. Curtis, Curtis abstain. Ehrman abstain. Flynn. Flynn, yes. Friedman. Friedman, no. Galloway. Galloway, yes. Goldstein. Goldstein, no. James. James, yes. Joyce. Joyce abstain. K. Yes. K, yes. K, K, yes. Canel. Canel, yes. Kettering. Kettering, emphatically, yes. <laughs> Clementus. Much abstain. Lamory. Lamory, yes. Lewinson. Lewinson. Mahoney. Mahoney, yes. Meltzer. Wait, Meltzer, yes. Mahalski. Mahalski. Myhawk. No, Myhawk, no. On Jovi. On Jovi. More. More, yes. Schneck. Abstain. Schneck abstain. Star. Star, yes. Star, yes. Song. Song, yes. She. She, yes. Zelter. Zelter, yes. Okay. Nineteen. So the motion does not carry. Nineteen. Fifty. I'm sorry. Uh, seven opposed. Twelve abstain. Greater than fifteen in favor. Good night, everybody. It fails. Okay. Tammy, back to you. Tammy, back to me. Okay. So I'd like to take this back, Betty, to committee in January because I'm not sure if the board really understood that about what they were voting on and it's the last resolution. So if you don't mind, if you're amenable, I'd like you to take it back to committee and take a look at where we could um, take that again. Um, for the full board, this has been an unprecedented month. What a hell of a way to kick off, uh, kick out 2020, I want to say. We've got a lot of big stuff ahead of us, but we've made the major leap tonight. It's been a long month. I really appreciate every single board member, the ones who I have been frustrated with. I apologize if I sounded short. The ones who I have let long, talk too long, I apologize. And to end it all, it's a cheers to you guys and thank you. I wish you all a very happy, healthy new year, and let's look forward to some great times in 2021.
Thank Same you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Happy a fun holidays. one. Right? Yeah, Happy, holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. 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 Happy holid